John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that boss the next. Big job there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, Duffy goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock em, sock em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull****. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. I say it every week after a pay-per-view, there is nothing quite like a numbered card recap on the Anakin Florian podcast. Monday, March 11, 2024. It is episode 473 of the show presented by DraftKings. Ken Flo was in Miami. You had an appearance for Cuervo on Saturday with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. And as I understand it, you were there with our guy, Big Ron Pellegrino, and you got pretty excited when uh, when that Dustin Poirier victory happened. That meant you swept the board on Place Your Bets. He said you got pretty fucking excited. Not quite Bitcoin going to $72,000 career high for Bitcoin excited, but you got pretty excited after that DP knockout. There were a lot of high fives, man. I was high fiving just random people in the bar. It was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, just, just an amazing car, man. Man, did that thing deliver. I, I meant to put up a video on my Instagram. I actually wanted to send it to you as well. But when Cheeto Vera walked out, I mean, that bar exploded. They were chanting like it was a soccer game. So the energy just in that place alone was insane. I can't even imagine at the arena of how it was when those guys walked out. But man, it was like it was so polarizing because you had your hardcore Sean O'Malley USA chants. And then you had your Cheeto Vera singing. They were literally singing in the bar when Cheeto walked out anytime the camera was on him. So again, the sport has just gone to a completely different level. You know, I, I'm not at these UFC pay-per-view events all the time, but just being in and around it, it's just totally different. How much this sport has exploded, John, it's wild, dude. It is absolutely wild. The nationalistic pride that a lot of these fans have for their fighters is just otherworldly. And when we were doing the arrival shots at the top of the pay-per-view, What's being shown on broadcast is also what is being shown, as we call it, in-house. Right. So when Cheeto Vera was shown in-house, bro, <laughs> you know, I had to completely raise my tone to match the audience so that the people at home could actually hear what I was saying. And right. Sean O'Malley is a huge fan favorite, but uh, Cheeto Vera's people came out and yeah. uh, I think that was part of... Uh, a just emotional heightened week for Cheeto. And we have a lot to get to, of course, in our UFC 299 recap today. We are also scheduled to be joined by the Matrix, Kyler Phillips. You got to think when the new Bantamweight rankings come out this week that uh, he will have a number next to his name. Ray Longo going to recap the piss out of this thing with us as well. And then we will also spin it forward, as we often do, uh, to UFC Fight Night, Tui Vasa versus Tabora. We will get no fewer than six main card selections from Ken Flo and Brian Petrie. And then I know Ken Flo can't wait <laughs> for Place Your Bets brought to you by JohnAnik.com because you'll find out just how much money you made. And uh, rest assured, you're in the black on the year. About time you caught a fucking break Jeez. here, huh? Tell me about it, dude. And if you do like my One More Sleep shirt or Ken Flo's Anik and Florian podcast sweatshirt, JohnAnik.com is uh, the website where you can support the program. Promo code One More Sleep. All right, Headlines is brought to you by Cuervo. Now's a good time to enjoy the tequila that invented tequila. UFC 299 is a wrap. Headlining act was the rematch between Sugar Sean O'Malley and Marlon Chito Vera, this time, though, with decidedly raised stakes for the UFC Bantamweight Championship. And uh, largely, it was all Sean O'Malley, except for that late body shot from Marlon Chito Vera. And had that shot landed maybe two minutes prior we could have a totally different narrative here on a Monday morning, but it is Sean O'Malley can flow by unanimous decision. 50-45 times two and a 50-44 on there as well. Masterclass, as Joe Rogan put it in the octagon from Sean O'Malley. He remains the hunted at 135 pounds. It, it certainly was a, a masterclass by Sean O'Malley. And I think the general consensus, which I think is correct, was that, hey, if it gets into the later rounds, if he's able to test O'Malley's chin, if he's able to test O'Malley's cardio, then Cheeto can pull this off. The problem is, is in order to do that, he would have to get by that technique disparity, that technique difference between him and O'Malley. And it just wasn't quite there. 
O'Malley is that good, and he's so technically superior to so many guys on the feet, and his length post is such a problem that he doesn't really allow for that to happen. Um, I, I think there there are still some question marks. Hey, if things get really difficult, if we get to those dark places that Gaethje has seen, that Dustin Poirier has seen, will he be able to come back from that? Can he respond through that insane adversity? Well, his tech re- technique really doesn't allow it. He doesn't let you get into, into that range. Uh, he's always in superior position to you. His long-range weapons are just that good, and his speed and power are just that good. So O'Malley had a hell of a performance, and that's how you erase a loss that he experienced against Cheeto Vera you know, way back uh, a couple years ago now. There are so many angles on the Sean O'Malley front. 12 UFC fights now. Only loss, of course, to Marlon Cheeto Vera, the fight in which he was injured. But his wrestling and his grappling really hasn't been on display at all in the UFC. And part of the reason for that is because a lot of these other athletes can't, as Jason Perillo put it, smother the speed and get inside to take this man down and challenge him in that realm. As we mentioned, going into that Aljamain Sterling title defense, he had an injured rib. And was he forced to grapple that night? Maybe he wouldn't have become the world champion, but. Aljo couldn't even get it there. And when Sean's takedown defense did have to hold up in that Sterling fight, it did. So in terms of the speed and the athleticism, Kenny, I know you touched on it, but just a huge discrepancy here. And I say that with all due respect to Marlon Chido Vera. They look like they were moving at different speeds, laterally moving forward. And I just think that, you know, sometimes some of these athletes like Sean O'Malley, who did play a bunch of different sports growing up, you know, they're just on a different plane when it comes to overall athleticism. And then they add mixed martial arts experience and training and they become just uh, just on a different level. And it did look like two levels to me. Yeah, big facts, my friend. I think that for O'Malley, his footwork was going to be a problem heading into that into that one. That was my concern for Cheeto. Uh, and, and really, that was the story of the fight. And you mentioned the athleticism as well. I, I think there's a couple things. I, <sighs> I think he struggles a little bit with how to put himself in a position to land the strikes and combinations that he wants. He will uh, kind of blitz himself in a position here and there, but O'Malley just knows where to be uh, and and when to be there. Um, And and certainly the speed was just a huge discrepancy, big disparity there in speed. Um, And it, it was frustrating Cheeto for sure. And then when he started mixing up those knees down the middle, man, Uh, Cheeto is so damn tough. I mean, he hit a lot of shots that would have knocked out most men at 135 pounds. Cheeto Vera is not most men. And O'Malley was just uh, able to expose a lot of different things. And it's a variety of weapons, too. It wasn't just his jab. It wasn't just that teep down the middle or the roundhouse. I mean, he was throwing a lot of different variety. Uh, And it shows just how talented O'Malley is. And I think a lot of people, they look at the hair, they look at the cockiness, they look at the lifestyle and how he lives and all that stuff. It's like, guys, you know, you may not like him, but you cannot deny this kid is highly skilled. Sorry about it. And he'll be the fan favorite, I would think, against most opposition not named Marlon Cheeto Vera. Although I will say Corey Sanhagen and Marab Dwalas Willie had pretty big fan bases, ardent in their own right. But let us talk about that knee if we could. Uh, I'm not sure if Marlon Cheeto Vera broke his orbital floor or his nose or all of the above. Ken Flo, have you ever broken a facial bone, not playing soccer, but actually training in mixed martial arts or fighting? Yeah, uh, see this big schnoz I got this. Yeah, uh, yeah this New Jersey barrier. Uh, it's got <laughs> it's gotten broke. It, it's gotten broke a, a couple times, John. Uh, but no, thankfully, it, it, nothing like in the cheek area, orbital area. You know, skull, jaw. Yeah. Um, it never had to deal with something like that, man. Um, but thankfully, but those are things that can affect you in a variety of ways. First of all, you know, there's the overwhelming pain. There's the swelling. Um, there's it. The ability to actually uh, take away eyesight in an eye or blur it or make yourself dizzy. Like these are things that fighters need to deal with. And for those that have been in there and those have seen this sport for a long time, uh, it, it goes without saying Cheeto Vera is an extremely tough individual who was determined to get that belt by any means necessary, um, but just wasn't able to get it done. So when you broke your nose, like, did you keep fighting? Did you keep going? Well, the good thing about breaking your nose in my experience is that it just goes numb. So you don't really feel it. <laughs> yeah. So you just kind of like, all right, my nose feels weird. I know it's there. I just, 
yeah, I can't really feel it like I did before. Um, so yeah, it just, I don't know. I mean, it, it impedes your ability to breathe well, uh, as well, you know, especially with blood start, start starting to come down there. But, um, yeah, it, uh, but I, I do think that is vastly different than, let's say, an, an orbital break, uh, right? It, it's way it's way less dangerous. I think breaking your nose is more typical. Yeah. Breaking your orbital, you, you may not be the same after. It, it, it has stopped other you know boxing careers, for example. Well, I'll tell you what I texted Marlon Vera yesterday. And oftentimes the hardest thing for me is after one of my friends, and I'm friends with both of these guys, yeah. but after somebody loses a fight like this, what do you say? So I wrote, I look up to you a lot, my man, inspired by your effort. Your fan base is amazing. When we showed you arriving to the arena, that place went absolutely fucking nuts. And if that body shot lands one minute earlier, you're probably the champ. Heal up, my brother. Much love. So that body shot at the end of the fight, a perfect left hook. Yep. Essentially on the horn. And Sean O'Malley eventually like cripples over up against the fence as he sort of recovers. And uh, I don't know if I'm suggestive of the fact that maybe had Cheeto just managed risk a little bit differently earlier that this mm. could have materialized. I mean, this was a very one-sided fight as many expected it to be. Uh, but it just goes to show you in mixed martial arts, Kenny, right? That body shot was one of the most debilitating strikes landed in that fight on either side. And it was Cheeto's best shot. It just happened to come literally at the end of the fight. Yeah, it, it definitely was. Um, and it, it's definitely one of those, those shots that, um, will take the wind out of you. It will take your will out of your body. And you wonder what would happen if he did land that earlier. I think that, you know, again, Cheeto's inability to get off to a great start hurt him here once again. And again, I think that goes back to his footwork or maybe lack thereof uh, early on. But, you know, I, and maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating there. Maybe there's something else going on. But, um, you know, it does take Cheeto a little while to start to get his rhythm and to find his range. And um, uh, going the way of the body, I think, would have definitely helped him. It was just very difficult to get on the inside and, and, and do things uh, at a high level there against Sean O'Malley. He's just very, very good, man. He really is. He has said to us repeatedly in the fighter meetings that he gets calmer as these fights get bigger. And gosh, man, those visuals before the fight, the guy is just totally chill. And I don't know if for you, there's anything that you could apply to this conversation, like when the fights got bigger for you. Certainly the first time you fought Sean Shirk for the championship, uh, it happened pretty quickly, right? But yes. did you feel like you were calm going into the BJ Penn and Jose Aldo fights relative to title eliminators? Because uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but like yeah. when you walked out to fight Joe Stevenson and a true title eliminator, the co-main event under Randy Couture and Brock Lesnar, maybe no I. There may be the most eyeballs ever on you. I mean, certainly the BJ Penn fight, but some of your better performances were in your biggest fights. You know, for me, and I, and I stress this to other fighters, that your, your confidence really emanates and, and stems from your training, your, your training camps in particular for that fight. And I think that Sean Shirk, I was most nervous for, definitely, um, I, I think, Um the BJ Penn fight, actually, oh, probably I was probably more nervous at the BJ Penn fight. I, I had a horrible training camp for that one, um, and then for the Aldo fight, had a had a terrible uh, weight cut. However, I, I did I did feel good heading into that from a confidence standpoint, just based on where my skills were at. So it varies, man. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Like for certain fights, if I'm feeling good and I know I had a good training camp, I'm like, let's let's go bring this, you know, whether it's the Takanormi Gomi fight or, or the Stevenson fight. Um, so I, I think that I don't know. I, it looked to me like this was a healthy O'Malley who had been in there with Cheeto Vera and we saw that confidence and composure of him walking out here and he really does relish in the spotlight. Um, and I think he's envisioned this for a large part of his life. So he feels comfortable in this spot. And I do think that Kenny Florian as a non-champion would be very different than Kenny Florian as a champion. Um, I, I think there is some kind of validation and security that happens when you have that belt. And it seemed to, reveal itself with O'Malley walking in there and defending the belt for the first time. He just seemed like he was a little bit more at home. Yeah, no, I think you put that beautifully. And I think you're wise to point to his health because any health that he was lacking going into the Aljamain Sterling fight, he certainly had uh, at UFC 299. Let us hear from Sean O'Malley after the fight 
on that knee that Cheeto Vera landed and the extent to which he was compromised. Fuck, he hit me with a nice body shot. Tim told me, like, don't sit. You don't need to. You want, you're winning the fight. You don't need to sit there. But I just, oh, I wanted that finish so bad. I thought I could sit in the pocket and fucking trade. And he hit me with a nice body shot. And I just was like, all right, he whooped his ass. I'm going to sit down and chillax for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Sean, a little bit dismissive of it, I guess. But in terms of the risk mitigation in that fifth round, there was none of it from Sean O'Malley. Yeah. I mean, his output was absurd in that fifth and final round. And as you heard there, it fl flew in the face of what Tim Welch was looking for. Bro, he was in shape, man. He was in shape. A and he realizes in order for him to be effective, he has to be in crazy shape. He needs that volume uh, and he needs that ability to throw a lot of shots because guess what? He's going to land a lot of those shots. And that's what guys are going to try to test. Certainly, that's what Marab Dualashvili is going to try to test. What's your conditioning like against me, bro? And uh, that is going to be something to see. I think we will see that uh, sometime in the near future. But, yeah, he was ready for this, man. And, and it shows the respect that he had for Cheeto Vera heading into this fight. I think it was a little risky you know, with him being in the lead. But I also think for me as a coach, I would have been fine with it in a lot of ways as well just because he did have the speed advantage. Positionally, I thought he was in a good spot. Um, he did give up that body shot, uh, but yeah, man, he was in control, uh, for really every single minute of that fight. Yeah. And I do think that he would have been able to fight through that body shot for a couple yes. minutes if need be. Right. So, uh, but congratulations to Sugar Sean O'Malley. He was a little bit self-critical after the fact in terms of not getting the finish. There have not been a lot of decision wins for O'Malley thus far in the UFC he had to settle for, uh, a unanimous decision here. Let's hear from Sugar Sean uh, on his disappointment in not putting Cheeto Vera away. Yeah, something about not getting the finish that just doesn't sit right with me. It's just like, fuck. But, um, I, you know, I also haven't watched it, obviously. Once I watch it back, I think I'll be a little bit more excited. But, you know, I always, always want to get that finish. Yeah. All right, so we have talked in the past about Sean O'Malley and how he has had a lot of grappling-heavy training camps. Yeah. Augusto Tanquino Mendez and Tim Welch putting him through the paces. Brandon Harris, the strength and conditioning coach, one of my good friends, just a huge force in this preparation process in terms of uh, the cardiovascular base, the breathing. Uh, this is really an athlete that is investing in himself and training at the highest of levels. But Kenny... He now seemingly will have an opponent, the number one contender, Marab Dwalishwili, and more on this coming up with Ray Longo, of course, but who will test him in those realms. So as we do spin it forward, if we could table the Ilya Topuria business for a minute, if not a year, if not 18 months, uh, what are your thoughts on Sean O'Malley presumed to be making his second title defense against the number one contender, Marab Dwalishwili? There's no question in my mind that that is the most difficult matchup for him in that division from a stylistic standpoint. A lot of difficult matchups. That that division is filled with killers. Um, but I do think that Marab, from a stylistic standpoint, is perhaps the most difficult uh, style matchup for him um, just because of his ability to put you on your back, keep you there, and act like you know, a Wolverine that is on methamphetamines. Huh. Um, you know, it, it's he does not stop. And I don't think there's a guy out there in in and around that weight class that you can find to replicate that stuff. Sean O'Malley's going to have to do like, you know, I used to do fresh guys every round. He's going to need like fresh guys every half a round. Every minute, you know, right. For every just wrestler heavy guys that are in your face that are going to be shorter than you that are going to be on you. Every second of that round, again, every half round, that, that's how he prepares for this fight. That's what he's going to need. He's going to have to invest in that training camp, and the training camp should probably start today. Right. I love it. So Marab is about a two to one favorite, at least right now, over Sugar Sean O'Malley. But I don't know, man, you still got to catch him. And there's a lot of risk to be navigated for Marab getting inside. Certainly, he is relentless in pursuit. And I think the question arises as to. Where is Marab's top game? What is his ability to actually keep Sean down there and do appreciable damage? O'Malley, I think defensively as a grappler, can use his length. And I do think his get-ups are pretty good. You know, I just think nobody's really seen the work that this guy is doing. And I think that, uh, you know, Marab and his coaches are going to have to be acutely aware of that fact. Our poll question for uh, 
the show was of the four fighters listed here. Marab Dwalishwili, Corey Sandhagen, Pyotr Jan, and Umar Nurmagomedov. Who is the biggest threat to Sean O'Malley's Bantamweight title reign? And you said off the top there that you believe it's Marab. 66% of about 7,000 people agree with you then. 16% said Umar Nurmagomedov, 14% Corey Sandhagen, and 4% for Pyotr Jan. We'll get to Pyotr Jan later. I fucking love that guy. I can't wait to see him in a rematch with Sean O'Malley. And it's amazing to think that how much this one win could do for him because, uh, man, when he hit that zone, there's nobody better to watch. But do you think that Marab is going to, I'm not asking for a fight prediction, do you think that he can chain takedowns and keep Sean O'Malley down when you see Marab Dwalish Willie minus 205 or so, Sean O'Malley coming back plus 175? You know, give us an early feel from you as to who you think actually wins that fight and who can sort of inflict their style upon the other. You know, you can never rule out anything in this sport. And I think you're right to talk about a lot of those grappling heavy fight camps where we haven't seen O'Malley do some of that. We saw some of that against Jan, who really was trying to keep him down, was really trying to utilize that grappling heavy game plan. And Shingo really wasn't allowing for it. I thought he did a fantastic job of getting back to his feet. And the fact that we've seen him experience a little bit of that, I think is a great sign. I also think you have to be really careful with those guys that you don't have a lot of info on, right? I mean, it's very easy sometimes to go, I'm destroying everybody on the ground. Sean O'Malley has nothing for me. Let me go in there and just do this. And whoops, you get submitted or whoops, you got, you can't keep them down. And some of the most difficult guys to keep down are those tall and lanky guys. They're a pain in the ass. Now, can O'Malley sustain that over the course of 25 minutes? That is more the question for me is can his conditioning hold up? I think skill-wise, he can be right there with Marab for about 15 minutes or so. After that, I'm not so sure if there's a human alive that could do that. That's why I'm saying that. But I do think there's an advantage in a lot of ways when you haven't showed a lot of aspects to your game. I, I think being able to train in secret and hide some of those skills is a huge advantage. I was extremely quiet about what I did and how I did it from tra from a training standpoint. Right. Um, why? Because, you know, there's a reason why, you know, militaries all over the world are doing things at secret locations sure. when they're training, right? They don't attack you when you're ready. They attack you when you're not ready. And, and right. there's a reason for that. Right. So Marab Dwalishwili and Ilya Topuria are fellow Georgians and friends. And Ilya Topuria said, Sugar, congrats. Was a beautiful performance. There is a fight chasing you with Marab. Get that done first. And Ilya's mom, Inga Topuria, actually commented on Facebook. It's been a long time since our Marab has earned this fight and it needs to happen. So Topuria is going to step aside. And I think for me, the question beckons with O'Malley. To what extent is he going to slow play this Bantamweight title reign? This was a fairly good turn, right? August yeah. in Boston and then returning in March. But I think it is hugely ambitious to think that Sean O'Malley is going to say headline International Fight Week, June 29th, in defense against Marab Dwalishwili. Now, we can look at some of these other Bantamweight contenders and be hopeful that things are going to move expeditiously. But I think you're getting one more O'Malley fight, Ken Flo, in 2024. You know, maybe it's Madison Square Garden. Maybe it happens earlier than that. Uh, you know, I don't think he's going to fast play his reign the way we've seen guys like Alexander Volkanovsky and Israel Adesanya, you know, step up and step in every three or four months. And and I don't think he should. Right. I don't think he should. I mean, how many guys have we seen that kind of start to push it a little bit more? Israel Adesanya, Volkanovsky, these guys. And they're like, I want to stay busy. And okay, cool. And, and I want to make as much money as possible. Okay, cool. However, your body may not think it's so cool. And, uh, and your training camps may not think it's so cool. There is preparation that you need to do uh, for, for a Marab Dwalashvili fight. Okay? And, and it is... A lot of work. It's a style that very few people are ready for, um, and you have to manage it correctly. And that also means not going too hard too quickly, which is something that I did against BJ Penn. I remember I came off a, ton a tonsillectomy. I got my tonsils removed, um, and I, I think I was training like a week after that, and I went so hard. And yeah. by the time the camp came around, I had nothing left the last like three weeks. It was like the worst training, worst sparring I've ever had in my life. My body was just dead. So even on that aspect, I mean, there is so much that can go right and wrong during a training camp. You have to manage it well. You have to respect your body. Let it recover um, and, and, and do the work. Um, so 
Yeah, I, I think he's going to slow his roll a little bit, take his time. I think June is way too quick of a turnaround. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm going to try to let that machine wait as long as possible in Marab Duwalish Philly. And he's lining his pockets in any number of different ways. Yeah. Sean O'Malley is already a wealthy man, and he's going to be uh, – very financially free when his career is said and done, even if he doesn't have some longstanding reign. But my biggest question mark for Sean O'Malley, short term and long term as a champion is always going to be durability. And it was nice to see his body get through these 25 minutes. Cardio, to your point, was fantastic. He was in a boot and a cast 10 minutes after the fight. Um, but Dominic Cruz talks a lot about his 2016 when he fought TJ Dillashaw in January, Uriah Faber in June, and then Cody Garbrandt in defense in December. Three title fights in a span of 11 or 12 months, and it was just biting off more than he could chew. So if you look at Sean O'Malley, August, and he got injured during that training camp for Aljamain Sterling, then this fight in March, so it would be June or July, which would be three title fights in a calendar year. I just don't think that that is going to be the course for Sean O'Malley. So those expecting to see this momentum continue sometime this summer, I just think you're going to have to be patient. You know, it seems like the Noche UFC focus is going to be the Mexicans. So I don't know. Maybe it's Madison Square Garden for Sean O'Malley and Marab Dwalish Willie. Maybe it's December, but I do think you're going to have to wait the better part of 2024 to see uh, the budding UFC superstar yep. Sean O'Malley again. But congratulations. <laughs> What a performance. Anything else on Sean O'Malley? I'm sure we'll touch on it with Longo, but anything else before we move on to the Diamond Ken? Fight? Yeah, I, I kind of want to just reiterate your point there. I, I think that if you look at some of the other champions in history and how they manage their careers, let's take Islam Mahashev and Habib Nurmagomedov. They are taking their time in between fights, and, and maybe that's for a variety of reasons, but they want to make sure that, that their body is ready to go at the most optimal levels. And um, I, I think that there's a reason why those guys have such fantastic records and, and you really don't see a whole lot of blemishes from them. You, you do have to manage them. You're, you're fighting the most elite fighters in the world, okay? And, and every damn little thing matters. A bad hair day can be the difference between you winning and losing. And I think for O'Malley, I, I think we're going to see him take a little bit more time. All right. We will ask Ray Longo later just how good – he thinks Sean O'Malley is. We're not going to get into the conversation as to the greatest bantamweight of all time, but we will get Ray and Ken Flo's thoughts on just how good Sean O'Malley is and, and maybe how good he can be. And of course, Ray Longo will be in the opposite corner in all likelihood the next time Sean O'Malley defends his title. Dustin Poirier over Benoit Saint-Denis. The knockout comes at the two minute and 32 second mark of round two. Kenny just can't contain that smile <laughs> ear to ear. He closed plus 185, the betting underdog on DraftKings Sportsbook. And uh, my thesis statement at this point on Dustin Poirier is that he does not need the undisputed UFC lightweight championship for his legacy. And that is an amazing statement to think that he has realized so much success in every other fucking bucket and compartment that he does not need the undisputed championship. But Kenny, let us talk about this result Uh you saw it coming the whole way, Dustin Poirier by KO in round two. Yeah, there's a reason I had so much drool on my desk here before <laughs> the last fight. I was like, I, am I not seeing something here? What's going on? Now, listen, BSD had some great moments in that fight. And you're talking about a special forces soldier. All those things are pertinent and relevant here. Um, however, when you're going against a guy in Dustin Poirier who has gone to hell seen the devil and go, he's, he's not really a bad guy. It's actually not too bad. It, it, you might like it. It's, it's, it's enjoyable sometimes. I, this guy, he's done it against Max Holloway. He did it against Gaethje. He did it against Chandler. He did it against all these guys. And it's like, he knows that too. He knows that, which is why he has accepted. And I truly believe him when he says that he knows he may, he may leave a piece of him and probably will leave a piece of himself inside that octagon and be careful with the guy who has already accepted those terms and those consequences. That is a very dangerous man. He knows how to survive. He's made adversity his friend. And I think that's what we saw here. It wasn't always the prettiest thing, but Dustin Poirier was going to find a way, and he was going to fight to the bitter end. But more than anything else, on the finish itself, those shots on the inside were just brutal it was wide arcing punches from benoit saint denis and short crisp accurate punches from dustin poirier and man when he sees that you're hurt he's gonna he's gonna put an end to it 
There were a lot of reasons for Dustin Poirier to take this fight. One of them was because he knew if he could produce this result, and in his head, this was probably a very likely result, that it would endear him to an even greater extent to the masses, right? But you also fight Benoit Saint-Denis before he gets really fucking good. So this kid is just getting going, Kenny. He's 27 years of age. I thought at times... It was reckless abandon, which maybe is a good thing. And other times I thought it was just a little bit reckless, a little bit too rushed. You know, he doesn't necessarily want to rush his career as much as his call out of Dustin Poirier suggests. And I bring that up because, as we mentioned, he had a big win over somebody in in France, maybe Thiago Moises in September. And then the promotion turned him around quickly to fight Matt Frivola in November. And even even though he kicked Matt Frivola's head back to Long Island, just kidding, Sal, I love your boy. Even though that result happened, it doesn't necessarily mean that he should have taken the Matt Frivola fight as quickly as he did. And then the next thing you know, he's fighting the former UFC interim lightweight champion and future Hall of Famer, Dustin Poirier. So, you know, I do think that all careers are handled differently. It's great that Benoit Saint-Denis is on the fast track. I'm sure his show money is already pretty good. But Kenny, he is very much a developing fighter at 27 years of age. He is. And I also think that's why Dustin Poirier followed Sun Tzu's thinking of know your enemy. And what I mean by that is a fighter is going to fight. And if you can lure him in those spots, Benoit was not going to turn down a fight. And I think he was able to lure him in to go, no, no, I know (laughs) this dude's a fighter and I'm going to make it a scrap. I've been there. I'm not sure you have. And I also think I have some technical skills that I can expose there. And Benoit did not turn out not did not turn down that crazy scrap and in tight that's where uh you know benoit kind of just fell victim to those short shots of dustin poirier um but i i couldn't agree more this is something that he's going to learn from he's going to learn a lot from this fight first of all seemed like he had some issues heading into this with a staph infection and all that stuff right there's that he's going to figure out he's more human than he thought he was but more than anything else he did lack the experience necessary to beat one of the great lightweights in UFC history in Dustin Poirier. So he's going to improve his his boxing, I'm sure. He's going to learn about patience after this one. As long as he goes back and watches this with a lot of honesty between him and his coaches, Benoit is going to be a problem moving forward. He looks like a welterweight out there because, listen, Dustin Poirier is a big dude, very big for 155 yeah. pounds. But Benoit was even bigger, dude. Like, he is massive for the weight class. He knows how to use his weight. He knows how to take you down and control you. He put Dustin in some really tough spots. He'll clean up his submission game even more, and he'll clean up his patience uh, and, and boxing and tight. And I think Benoit absolutely is going to be a problem in the future for a lot of lightweights out there. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And I know we were high for this conversation, I think, Kenny, but... I was talking to you a little bit about Benoit saint midsection and maybe him lacking the girth that I thought he would have. Right. And I bring it up in the context of Dustin Poirier talking about defending in the clinch and up against the cage and his hips. And maybe he wasn't necessarily as strong saint as Dustin expected. Now, part of that could have been because Benoit saint had staff and I believe was on antibiotics, right? And missed three or four days of critical training at some point in time. You know, he didn't really want to talk a lot about it, right? But I told you, Ken Flo, in whatever condition, that at the morning weigh-in, when these guys were weighing in, the official weigh-in, when I looked at them from the side, Poirier just had the thickness that saint did not at all have. And I know saint was sucked out, but I don't know, man. Like in terms of, of the hips and just the overall build, uh, you know, he's big and broad shoulders and fought at welterweight and all of those things. And a lot of Benoit saint career took place at 165 pounds versus Dustin Poirier fighting at featherweight. But uh, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting that I had that observation, pointed it out to you. And then Dustin talked about maybe saint not being as strong as he thought. Yeah, and it's why I, I took that observation observation from you with a lot of seriousness. Um, I, I think that absolutely could be a factor. Um a couple things. First of all, having been on antibiotics before a fight because of staff, uh, it weakens you. There's no question about that. Or it weakened me anyway. That that was how I dealt with taking antibiotics. I also felt like my, my energy just wasn't the same. And also my ability to cut weight wasn't the same. For whatever reason, I seem to retain a lot more water on antibiotics than maybe some other people. Um, so that could have been the case as well. And having to do a weight cut like that when your body's trying to hold on to as much water as possible as it 
fights a nasty infection, well, that's the perfect storm in a very bad way. Uh, so, yeah, and I also think for, for people uh, at home who may not get those close looks, when you're able to get up and close and personal and see these guys right in front of you during weight cuts, as they're walking, what their demeanor is, how their eyes look, how sucked down, like those are things that a camera and a television uh, just can't really relay as well as you being right there. And, and yeah. that's why I took that comment with such seriousness. It's a real thing, man. When you, when you see that, y y you'll notice it and, and they can affect you again, especially, especially at the highest levels. Benoit saint has a lot of things going for him and we will get to Poirier, rest assured. I'm going to suck his dick on the other side. <laughs> But Benoit saint has a lot of things going for him, right? Certainly France is blowing up as far as their overall national interest in mixed martial arts. Yeah. His ability to carry that market, I think, is undeniable. Cito Gan factors into that equation as well. Mm. He also has this fight that he received against Dustin Poirier very early on in his career. And you got to think there are different reasons as to why he got this fight, right? But part of the reason it appealed to Dustin was because he was all the rage with the fan base. This dude on the seek and destroy mission just dusting all of these lightweights, right? So he's going to get big fights, Kenny. But I ask you, fact or fiction, does Benoit saint ever reach the top five or fight for the UFC championship? Gosh, I'll say fiction as of right now. Um, I, I think that you have a guy at the top of the division who is a superior wrestler, a, a superior grappler, and a superior striker, uh, for that matter. So I don't see a whole lot of people beating Islam Mahashev, but I, I think just think they have similar games, and Islam just has a better one at this stage of the game. But I do think he will probably fight for a title at some point. I, I do think he's that good, and I do think he carries that level of determination to be able to get back to yeah. the top and come back from that last loss to, to Dustin Poirier. Yeah. I do think Benoit saint eventually will work his way into the top five. I just think it's a hard division to suggest that uh, that anybody could be a future UFC lightweight champion. But I'm excited to see the the reascent for Benoit saint uh, But Dustin Poirier, man, I mean, what else can be said? And I know at times he's been flattered to hear us refer to him as a future Hall of Famer. And he continues to just make that undeniable, I think, with every passing fight. And it's amazing to think that as Justin Gaethje, Wins the BMF belt the, in the manner in which he did against Dustin Poirier last July. And now people are talking about Dustin Poirier fighting Islam Akashev. It's a little bit murky and muddy as far as Gaethje is concerned, because Justin Gaethje, to me, is the rightful number one contender. And if he beats Max Holloway, should challenge for the belt. Um, but gosh, man, how do you not at least consider rewarding Dustin Poirier based upon the entire body of work, this 22nd UFC win, accepting this fight for the promotion, five-round co-main event, helping drive the pay-per-view with O'Malley. Um, Dustin Poirier back in prime position, man. And uh, a lot of people felt like if he could produce this type of result, he'd be exactly here. No question that Dustin Poirier has put himself in a great position here after that fight against Benoit Saint-Denis, a fight that he didn't really have to take. Um, I'll say this, as a guy that has seen Dustin Poirier when really he was just a kid and just starting, he was a featherweight back then, and to see where he is now as a man, um, it, it's amazing to see. Uh, it, it's why I like teaching jujitsu and martial arts so much. First, you get a kid who maybe may come in the gym, his head is down, shoulders curled over, doesn't really have a lot of confidence, doesn't look you in the eye. And then as they build skills, they become more confident, their self-esteem changes, all that stuff. I've seen that same development from Dustin Poirier, right, on a more extreme level. Um, and it's just awesome to see how martial arts and, you know, doing very well as a professional can change your life. And... Uh, Dustin's at a point in his life, I think, where he's taking it fight by fight. Um, he's really checking in with himself to see if he wants this, what he wants in his life, what's motivating him. And he's taking his steps very carefully, as he should. I think he really cares about his legacy. He cares about this sport and how he approaches it. Um, and he cares about his family, of course. So, I think we'll see him in one or two more fights. I, I think there will only be big fights from here on out. Um, and again, to see a guy who has always been nice and polite and has worked his ass off to get where he's at, um, 
how can you not be a fan of Dustin Poirier, man? So Ali Abdelaziz is a friend of mine. And uh, when I've dealt with various things in my career, he has reached out and uh, that has certainly resonated with me. But I do believe that he has a really difficult job because of how many high profile fighters he has in these high profile divisions. So here's what Ali Abdelaziz had to say on social media after Dustin Poirier's win over Benoit saint DP took a huge risk tonight and came out on top and looked amazing. Dustin versus Islam Akashem in June, especially since everyone else has fights. If the UFC is good with this, then Islam would be game. Now, it's complicated because Ali Abdelaziz manages Justin Gaethje as well, right. and he manages Gilbert Burns and Bilal Muhammad and a lot of these elite welterweights as well. But as far as the lightweight divisional pecking order and picture is concerned, Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier in my mind, are 1 and 1A as far as the greatest UFC fighters of all time to have never realized undisputed gold. And now they both have a case that Dustin didn't have 48 hours ago. But Justin Gaethje, on the strength of that win for the BMF championship, deserves to fight Islam Makashev, almost independent of what happens with Max Holloway. Now, if Max Holloway comes out and beats Justin Gaethje, then all of a sudden Holloway's a guy who's in the mix at 155 pounds. And I certainly wouldn't deny Max either. But it's crazy how muddy this is for Justin Gaethje. And I've got to think that if you're Justin Gaethje's family and friends, you're like, what is going on here, man? You know, we ha this is the best version of our guy, right? We beat Rafael Fazeev. And that was essentially Gaethje doing for Fazeev what Dustin Poirier just did for Benoit Saint-Denis, you know? Like, I just feel like if you're Gaethje friends and family, you know, you're excited for UFC 300. You're the betting favorite there defending the BMF belt. But... In part, you got to be like, what are we doing defending this made up belt when we have an ironclad case for a shot at the undisputed title? Yeah, and I think he does. Listen, I, I think uh, Dustin Poirier is uh, a fantastic candidate. However, I think Gaethje is in the driver's seat here. I think he's in a position with a win over Max Holloway to get that next shot. Now, and I love, there's another reason you love Dustin Poirier, right? That meme he posted about the guillotine, right? The game plan, and then looking back and going the guillotine. He kept going for that guillotine. So if I'm Islam Mahashev, right? It's like, I'm licking my lips too. I'm going, this guy can't stop my takedowns. He's not going to stop my takedowns. You're not getting me in a guillotine. I'm going right. to take you down on control. I'm going to do what Habib did to you. I mean, it's, I, and again, Obviously, I love Dustin Poirier. I just think it's not a great matchup for him. And talk about, you know, what we were talking about earlier with Sean O'Malley. If your goal is to hold on onto that belt for as long as possible, then guess what you do? You pick the fights that are going to set you up to be able to do that. And I think it's an easier fight for Islam Mahashev to face someone like a Dustin Poirier than it is against Gaethje. I think Gaethje is a little bit more dangerous because he does have that wrestling background. Now, I'm not sure he can stop those takedowns, but I do think because he does have that better defensive base, on paper at least, that I would consider him a more dangerous fight or a more difficult fight for an Islam Mahashev than, say, Dustin Poirier. And then, of course, you have that head-to-head -head battle that they had not too long ago. So, yeah, I, I think Dustin either may take a fight between you know between that and Islam. Um, he may take another fight or just wait to see how that plays out and then kind of slip in there for a championship fight. So, Th that's how I see it anyway. Yeah. And the calendar plays into this as well. I think part of the reason why you see Ali Abdelaziz and Islam Akashev may be pushing towards a Dustin Poirier fight is because Ramadan is now underway. June would align with their calendar. And if you're Justin Gaethje, you know, they're you got to think there are going to be some warlike tendencies in that fight with Max Holloway. You would probably want more time to prepare for Islam Akashev. And I do think that Justin Gaethje is probably going to make four or five million dollars at UFC 300, right, as a defending champion. And money is undeniably a part of all of this. Um, but man, Justin Gaethje has earned a championship opportunity and now so has Dustin Poirier. So Dustin Poirier in this guillotine, man, guillotine. I'm I'm channeling my inner Frank Mir calling it a guillotine. <laughs> but, uh, that's fine, yeah. So, you know, I'm I uh, the guillotine came up on the broadcast, and I, I look down and I see I think seven career wins by submission for Dustin Poirier, none of them by guillotine. <laughs> um, but fuck, if he's not going to continue jumping him, uh, I don't know if it's in this soundbite when he sort of was intimating that you uh, you secure zero percent of the gillies that you don't <laughs> jump. You cannot deny those facts. Let's hear from Dustin after the fact in terms of his uh, pension for uh, not heeding his coach's advice and jumping the gillies. 
It seemed like in the second round, maybe there was a moment you thought, maybe I don't always have to jump the ghillie. I've, I've nope. <laughs> I never thought that uh, once. No. <laughs> Another thing, too, like I thought he was going to be a little bit – he was physically strong, but I thought techni- technically – I know he comes from a judo background. I thought his hips and his grip strength was going to be better against the fence. I took myself down every time. You know, When I was on the mat, it was because I jumped guillotines, and you miss all the ones you don't jump, first of all. But I thought he was going to be a little bit tougher with the takedowns against the fence. That's pretty amazing. interesting. And that audio is pretty interesting, is it not? Yeah. About just the strength against the fence. And- a- absolutely. And listen, um, that's the other thing about being in a fight, right? It's like the fighter, you should always concede that the fighter is going to know best there. He was following a feeling, and I think that's a very important thing. And you can't actually argue that it wasn't effective in certain spots. He actually was hitting that front kind of uh, Greco-style guillotine with the head in the middle, almost that 10-finger choke. And... Benoit was letting go of those t- those takedowns at times, right? The ones where he was jumping it, uh, jumping uh, on them against the cage. I'm not sure I love that aspect of it. Uh, he certainly doesn't want to do that against Islam Mahashev, right. in my humble opinion. Sure. Um, however, uh, th- you you could argue th- there were some spots where they were effective, and of course, being in a choke um, can definitely take away some of the energy. Uh, and, and you can't say that didn't play a part in that fight against Benoit. So. Uh, he was feeling it and going for it and, and ended up working, man. He ended up getting the win. So kudos to to Dustin. Uh, but like, again, him posting that meme, it just shows just how he doesn't take himself that seriously. I mean, uh, you got to love it, man. All right, well, we congratulate Dustin Poirier. And I do think it's interesting when Dustin was preparing for Khabib Nurmagomedov, he said, I'm not going to know exactly how he feels until I'm in there with him. And uh, rest assured, Khabib was just as fucking strong as Dustin. <laughs> All right, that was Headlines brought to you by Cuervo. Now's a good time to enjoy the tequila that invented tequila. And now it's a good time to get to the star of the program in the Ray Longo Minute. It's now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. The star of the Anik and Florian Podcast, Raymond Peter Longo. Good to see you. Good morning. You just roll out of bed. We banging cold brew or what? Oh, yeah. hundred percent. What time did you go to bed? What time did you rise? Right now, it's 1150 a.m. Eastern. I think we're all still feeling the effects of losing that hour. No, I got killed yesterday I, and I went to bed about two thirty three last night. <laughs> My circadian rhythm is in the shitter, as they so say. I went up to do the post fight show. It was one thirty three wow. a.m. that I got on set and then. You lost that hour during the post show. So I got back to my room at about 3.50 a.m. And uh, yeah, I'm all over the goddamn joint today, Raymond. But what are you going to do? I mean, we show up for this audience and we always tell folks this show will never be behind a paywall. It may cease to exist at some point down the line, but this show will always be free. And we're always going to do whatever we can in whatever condition to be here and uh, bring you content and bring you Ray Longo. How was your weekend, kid? Oh, man, it was good. Enjoyed the fights. Everything's going good. Getting ready to go to Vegas this week for uh, Charla Lampos. We call him Pompos. Got a big fight this week, and I'm uh, very excited. All right, I'm looking at UFC Fight Night 2, Ivasa versus Tabora, and the first fight of the night out of the red corner, Chara Lampos Gregorio. Is that how you pronounce it? Fighting Shad and Helliger? Uh, it's it's it, 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 that's how you pronounce it. It's good enough for me. I don't know if it's good enough for him, but uh, all right, we call him the great Pompini. All right, well, tell me a little bit about this kid. Oh, great kid uh, from uh, Greece. Uh, has come a long way, man, and uh, you know, got on this, got a, got into the UFC with a really great knockout on the contender series, and uh, I think he's getting better and better. Really, really happy working with him. He's had a great camp, and I expect uh, expect a, I expect a great night. But you know, it's MMA, so but I wouldn't expect anything. But he put in a really, really, really good camp, and he's a great kid. Does our friend Big Ron Pellegrino, owner of the Paradise Cantina, know that you're going to be at the UFC Apex this weekend? Uh, <laughs> no, but I hope he knows now. Yeah, he knows. Big now. Ron, get ready, baby. Coming in early. Ray Longo is coming in. Get the ladies ready. Get the alcohol get ready. Without a doubt. Get it all ready for Raymond. What's all a right. Vegas trip without the ladies, John? I'm telling you, everybody loves Raymond. All right, so how good is, Sh- is Sugar Sean O'Malley? I mean, is your guy Marab Dwalish really going to beat this kid? How good is Sugar Sean O'Malley after what you saw this weekend? 
But it looked pretty damn good. It looked pretty damn good. Great movement, holds the range really well. Uh, obviously, there was no attempts at any type of grappling. I think, obviously, that's the difference. Uh, you know, look, you, you're going to have to kill Marab to keep him off you. I think it's going to, I think that's a really great matchup, Kenny, as far as, you know, you got a total wrestler maniac against a guy who can hold the reins, who is a sharpshooter. So I think that matchup is phenomenal. I don't think it's easy for either guy, but um, like, again, if you don't stop this guy with something, he, he's going to get his hands on you and then we'll see what happens. But uh, I love the fight and uh, you know, he looked great. I mean, he did look great. I mean, Cheeto, you know, you could see every time Cheeto pressed a little bit and went for it, it was like a, a different dynamic. But when you sit on the outside and wait for this guy, just not not a good strategy. Kempfel might be on mute. I actually bought Kenny a mug that said you're muted. <laughs> uh you know, so I was actually going to keep it for myself. So every time this motherfucker mutes himself, I can just hold it up like dick fuck. You're oh, muted. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I, I actually like went to get it today and it's in the it's in the dishwasher today. But, I like uh, that. Yeah, I, I like that. I, yeah, I like that a lot. Hey, but listen, the winner to me, this whole the, the whole is Dustin Poirier. Yeah, I cannot say anything. I can't say anything but great things about this guy. No upside to taking this fight. The guy disagree was disagree with that, but I agree well, what's with the, most what's of the what upside? I mean, if he wins, he beat a guy that was ranked what? You know, if he loses, he lost to a guy that was ranked what? You know what I mean? I'm just saying in that respect. I mean, he he gave that kid a chance. The kid was on a tear. Uh, he survives a pretty rough first round. He's, he's That's a gangster, man. The way he speaks on the microphone, he seems like he stands for all the right things. I, I don't know. I got a new respect for him after this fight. I always liked him. But after this fight, he came off a head kick knockout with Gaethje. Uh, there was a lot of risks involved in this. He's getting older. Yeah. Uh, he was talking about maybe it's his last fight. You know, I didn't like the way that sounded. Uh, but wow, I, I'm just super, super impressed. And, uh, you know, he kind of exposed uh, Benoit. You know what I mean? The, the uh, Maybe it was what he said with the antibiotics, but like his punches looked like they were in slow motion. They were arm punches in the second round. You knew that when you started seeing that Kenny, that he was just going to get lit up. I mean, uh, Howard Davis's son, beautiful job. The guy's yeah, not Daya even, Davis. I mean, beautiful job. Yeah. What, what's his first name? Daya. Daya. Yeah. What a great job. And he knew it. He could see it from the outside that not even in the same stratosphere striking, right. you know, and, uh, I think uh, maybe because I don't know what it was. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know. It just it didn't look it, it it didn't look good. And you knew that he survived that first round. Once I started seeing those punches coming, I go, oh, that's just not that's going to be it, 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 a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. Guys, we my muted it? is acting up. No, I mean, it's just no. this roadcaster. You can have nice equipment in a fucking home studio, but it doesn't mean it's always going to work. But uh, it sounds like you guys no, can I hear think, me now. Yeah, I think the roadcaster yeah. didn't get sleep. The roadcaster is the the roadcaster is half page, asleep obviously. as well. I mean, this is this is simple. I guess I just see more upside in this matchup for Dustin Poirier than certain other ones, like a fight with Benil Daryush. And part of the issue, right, is that a lot of these guys, Armand Sarukyan, Mataj Gamrot, are his American top team teammates. So some of the other young up-and-comers in this division that have single digits next to their name are his teammates. But right. I just think that after what Benoit Saint-Denis did to five straight lightweights, including your guy Matt Frivola, yeah. there was upside and upside to fighting Benoit Saint-Denis at 27 instead of when he's 30, 31 and closer to his fighting prime. Because Saint-Denis, uh, maybe there was some exposure that happened this weekend, but I do think that a lot of it is just that he's inexperienced. Yeah, well, I agree with that, but uh, I still think it was a it was a class act move for Dustin to give this no kid doubt. a chance. No I, doubt. I don't want to take away from that. And I'm I'm not and I'm not gonna take away from that. No, I of mean course. He, and he said it. He gave Eddie Alvarez a chance and he's just a good guy. Or Eddie Alvarez gave him a chance, whatever he said. But uh I I I loved I loved everything about that fight. And I think to me that was the uh that was more of a highlight to me than even uh, you know, O'Malley's performance. The first time I said your favorite fighter's favorite fighter, I was referencing Justin Gaethje and 
I've used that on Max Holloway before, but yeah, I mean, Dustin Poirier, I feel like he's your favorite fighter's favorite fighter. And uh, yeah. I could not find a single fighter out there, not one single pro fighter. I probably talked to 25 of them. Not one that was picking Benoit Santini, not a one. Wow. And yet the betting line stayed where it did. I mean, he closed, Dustin closed plus 185. You know, they're trying to get two-way action. I feel like some of these books had to get fucking killed on that Poirier result, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So real quickly, in terms of the matchup between Sean O'Malley and Marab Dwalishwili, and then we'll get to some other UFC 299 items with the star of the show, Ray Longo. So you heard Jason Perillo in the lead up to this fight talking with about Marlon Cheeto Vera smothering the speed, right? Like Marab is very quick on his feet. I'm just curious, Ray, and I don't know how much you want to peel back the curtain, but you know, how confident are you that you can you know, make this a ground fight and just chain takedowns and tire the fuck out of Sean O'Malley. You guys are a two to one favorite right now. You know, pressure's on you guys. You're the fucking two to one favorite. How confident <laughs> yeah. are you can chain takedowns and work your top game and do damage on the ground and, and actually keep Sean down? Me, I'm pretty confident. <laughs> I knew he was going to give me two words. I knew you're going to give hey, me listen, just two words. You know, look, you could talk about smothering the speed all your I mean, listen, that, that I, I love it. But somebody has to do it. You know right. what I mean? He didn't look anytime he made the attempt to smother the 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 speed. I thought he did great. I mean, yeah. it was far and very far and few in between. But you could see when he pressured him, uh, you know, whatever. I thought I thought he had maybe minimal success. But the other guy pitched a, a beautiful fight. But uh, it's a it's a totally different animal when Marab's in there. And he's kind of been training for him for for a year or two. Right. You know, he no, knew that, right. that was going to be the fight. So yeah, uh, you it's know, good point. luck. And you know, the fact that he couldn't get Cheeto out of there, I think, is a great. I mean, he basically, I'm not saying this disrespectfully, but he he wasn't getting much offense coming back. And the guy went five rounds with him. It was almost like the Putino fight. Yeah, he beat him up. But he couldn't get rid of the kid, you know what I mean? Or he did it at the yeah. end, whatever it was. Yeah. But Marab's, you, you, you're not going to be able to do. You could, you could light him up, but there's going to be a price to pay, and then you're going to have to do it again and again. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, we'll see, see if it's, uh, it's going to be a great fight. It's not an easy fight for sure, you know. Yeah, we'll see if Marab's chin is, and durability is tested the way right. Marlon Cheeto Vera's was because. Kids probably got three facial fractures, if not more. But yeah, he was not finished on this night. So, well, it's exciting, man. It really is exciting. And, uh, you know, Ilya Topuria is not going to be next for Sean O'Malley. It's going right. to be your guy. I just think you guys might have to wait until uh, Madison Square Garden. Maybe you can get him at the UFC Apex in that little 25-foot octagon. That might help you guys. Well, we could get him in the parking lot. Let's just get him. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, as good as he looked in that fight, I saw nothing. That indicated he's beaten Taporia. He has died. Taporia is a totally different animal. And, uh, you know, maybe in yeah. the future, but I love the way, yeah. the, I love the way Ilya stuck up for Marab and won't take that fight until he fights him. I, right. this is the shit I love. I love that type of stuff. You I know, know what you I mean? Do. Where it comes before everything. Yep. And that to me is, is classy. And, uh, you know, that's the way it should be. People have yeah. to stick together because if not, you know, they're going to have to follow other people's guidelines and that, that who the hell wants to live like that. I know I give you a hard time on the show, but I would take a bullet for you, buddy. You know how much I love you. I just gotta, gotta oh, yeah, give you a little jab. He would take one of the, he'd take a bullet from one of those non-lethal guns. Kevin. Right. A BB gun. You know? yes. Yeah. Yeah. A BB right. gun. He'd take a pellet. Yeah. yeah. I'd take a pellet for you. I'd take a paintball for you any day. Right? <laughs> Thank you, John. So, all right, I think we've sort of exhausted Sean O'Malley and Marab Dwalishwili. It's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out. One thing that we have not exhausted is the octagon size and how it might have an impact on certain matchups, particularly this main event. A lot of people, uh, and these are fighters out there, Kenny and Ray, you can respond to this if you are so inclined, are suggestive that like it's a different sport in that 25-foot octagon. And certainly with particular matchups, Kenny, you, it's undeniable. Like the surface area, it's like 31% bigger, right? So for Sean O'Malley to be able to use his gifts and his footwork in a 35 foot octagon, never mind the crowd, as opposed to that regional thing they trot out at the UFC apex. I think to dismiss that as a factor, I feel a little bit, uh, you know, ignorant for not bringing it more into the context of this matchup at all leading up to it. I don't know. Am I crazy? 
Yeah, I mean, every every 12 inches matters, right, guys? Is that, that the deal? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, listen, I, I, I think it's a big factor. It really is. And if I'm fighting Marab Dwalish Feely, I'm going, can we get a 60-foot octagon? Is that possible? <laughs> yeah. And can I get a scooter in here as well? Um, it, it's going to be tough, and, and it definitely can influence the way the fight goes. Having that, that, that extra space to move around and, and having to do it against a guy who is going to pursue you um, it really does matter. There, there absolutely is an advantage of being in a smaller octagon if you are a grappler, and there's a larger advantage if you're a striker being in a larger octagon. Um, but at the end of the day, it does come down to how you manage that environment, how you cut off that cage, what kind of skills you bring in, how you're setting up your takedowns, all that stuff. And I think with all of Marab's experience, he's fighting Sugar at the right time or will, or will fight him at the right time. Hey, Ray. Yes. What'd you think of 36 year old Michael Venom Page making his UFC debut against Kevin Holland? Uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's not my type of thing, but uh, you got to respect the guy for being 36. And he uh, totally frustrated the hell out of that yeah. poor kid. He just, you know, when you could get to that point where you could uh, almost make a guy just want to quit at the end of the fight, like it, that's that's pretty cool. But uh, if we saw every fight like that that night, I think it would have wouldn't have been like a, a happy thing or a good thing. Kenny, I'm not a mixed martial arts expert, but I really enjoy watching Michael Venom Page compete. It's amazing to watch a man who's 6'3 with an 80 inch reach and hands, you know, that size just to move like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, maybe not in some part the fight that people were expecting, but what'd you think of MVP on the big stage? And what do you think about him moving forward in a very difficult division? Yeah, well, let's talk about the good things first, because um, I, I do think it's important to talk about. This guy, he's special. That, that's what I was talking about in regards to his talent, his speed, his skills, his length, his ability to kind of fight that Wonder Boy type of uh, game. Uh, it's a problem going against a guy who has that kind of footwork. It's even more of a problem to go against a guy who has that kind of reach and knows how to use it. So Kevin Holland... He tried to take him down. He tried to clinch him, and he was successful here and there. But you also have to give credit to MVP for working on the grappling side of his skills and getting back to his feet. Now, let's talk <laughs> about the bad thing. And, and really, it was just one bad thing, but it was happening throughout the fight. I think there's a problem when you're trying to look cool, when, you're, when wanting to look cool is more important than going out there and finishing the fight. And I think that's what we saw a little bit too much from MVP. He was showboating a lot, which was funny because typically it's Kevin Holland doing that. And that tend to put Kevin Holland in a weird mental space. He didn't really know what to make of it. So maybe that was by design and maybe it was very purposeful in what he was doing. However, I would have liked to seen him focus a little bit more on trying to get him out of there or being a little bit even more precise with his striking and trying to stop Kevin Holland from even continuing to move forward than him kind of showboating in between some of those sequences. Um, especially there was a time where I thought he had Kevin Holland out on his feet. Now that may have happened a few times during that fight, but there was one instance in particular where I thought he should have been a little bit more focused on trying to get Kevin Holland out of there. So, but either way, dude, he does things that I can't even dream of doing as a fighter. Well, uh, yeah. He's so talented, so good. Um, and he's going to be a problem for a lot of guys. And, you know, I saw wonder boy at that appearance at the Jose Cuervo, uh, thing. And man, I, I would love to see that fight one day. You know, those guys are just so unique, so special as karate fighters, uh, and that would be a very interesting fight in the future. Yeah, I agree with Kenny uh, on every, basically everything. But the Wonder Boy, listen, when Wonder Boy fought Holland, he pieced him up. Yeah, yeah you know, there great. wasn't the showboating; it was complete focus. There yeah. was combinations. I mean, he he technically beat the crap out of him. So I think that's the difference. But you hit on a good point where he had him in trouble. He chose to you know do the robot or whatever he was doing and. Uh, that, that, that's what I'm saying. Like if you had every fight like that, that night, I don't think it would have been as entertaining. It, it was good in the middle of everything just to see that type of talent. Cause I'm with you. Like I, I wish I could do, or, you know, could have done 1% of what that guy did. It's a gift. It really is yeah. a gift and not many people have it. And him and wonder boy, and they're pretty close in age. So I think I like, yeah, I yeah, like that's like going to be the fight. Yeah, I like that matchup, you know, and, you know, it could be just two guys looking at each other, bouncing on their feet, 
you know, with their hands down for right. about 10 right. minutes. But, you know, right. But when I they engage, what, it's going to be fun. That's going to be fun, man. It's going to be fun. And, uh, you know, oh. obviously, one of the boys, my guy, his dad, Ray Thompson. So I'd love to see that fight. I, I think everybody would at this point. Hopefully, Wonder Boy doesn't mind me talking about this, but I, I, I got a chance to talk to him for a little bit. Wonder Boy's the best, man. Such a good, yeah. humble dude. Uh, but he told me he actually broke his foot in, I think, not only one, but I think two places in that first round against Shavkat, which to me, if I'm looking back at that fight, it changes the narrative of how I saw that fight. Now, Shavkat certainly made his adjustments, but... Um, you said how the fight kind of went after that first round, and I don't, I didn't see that news out there, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating something that people already yeah. know. But the fact that he fought Shavkat with a broken foot, I mean, all everything comes off of Wonder Boy's movement and, and and mobility and and footwork and all that stuff. So the fact that he actually continued with that broken foot against Shavkat, I think, makes it. Um, I don't know. It, it makes the narrative a little bit different heading into that. And and those things happen during a fight. But uh, again, just another demonstration of how damn tough Wonder Boy is. Oh, 100 yeah. percent. All right. Let us get to Jack Della Maddalena, Woo! if we could, because seems like a Ray Longo type of guy here. Right. Uh, I mean, hard nose Jack Della Maddalena he gets Gilbert Burns out of there with that uh, beautiful knockout. It comes at 343 of round three. Gilbert Dorino Burns did win two rounds on two of the three judges scorecards. So perhaps Jack Della actually needed the finish here, man. Does he get it? And uh, we got a new bona fide top five welterweight contender, Raymond. What do you think about Jack Della? I think he, what a great performance. And when you hit adversity like that in the early rounds and you come back to win, and even though it was adversity, he was always in there, you thought. But uh, but he, he's just one of those old school Australian grinders, man. I, I do love he's he's great, great boxing, great mindset. I thought he improved in a couple of things. Uh and I thought Gilbert, you know, I he got to, I'm trying to think of how the scoring would have went, but Gilbert just he looks frantic when he's on his feet. Like he there's a nervousness that if they could calm him down a little bit, I think it would really, really help. Cause he's a you know, both both great guys, but he just looks frantic like this that 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 you know and that I, I, you know it i think it that's what got exposed a little bit to me ray you nailed it dude um i think that's exactly what it was and he definitely looked charged up yeah. in, in round one um it, it, there's just a lot of nervousness in how yeah. he's moving like they're almost there's like a panic even when he's yeah, doing yeah. well you're like this could go yeah. bad at any moment and i think that his Maybe an inability to control his emotions got the better of him of that fight because he made really a, a kind of a rookie mistake as a grappler. And we all know he's a world-class yeah. grappler. This is a world champion, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And what he did, if I can explain a little bit, was he got highly connected to the guy on bottom. And if you're highly connected to the guy on bottom as opposed to being stable and rooted to the floor, then that means that that guy, if he moves, can send you wherever he wants. And, and that was the problem. He kind of rooted down and tried to grip onto him. And Jack went to sweep him. He, he ended up moving him, of course, got back to his feet. And Jack, being the finisher that he is and the tremendous striker that he is, landed that knee and that started it all for him. And it just tend to, it, it tended to snowball very quickly. And it was almost like what, what Ray was saying. You kind of saw it coming. Like you knew that if it started to go bad for, bad for Gilbert, that he wasn't going to be able to emotionally come back from that. And we saw that in that fight against Kamaru Usman. Um, right. Like when things started to go down, it started to snowball very quickly. And and uh, it was unfortunate because that would have been such a big win for Gilbert um, and would have put him in a great spot in that very difficult division. So I think more than anything else, I, I think that Gilbert does have some good skills. I think he he should probably improve his footwork and overall stance a little bit moving forward. But yeah. more than anything, I think it was just the experience and that um, emotional energy maybe that came into him. Uh, came came with him into that fight. Yeah, I mean, there's people in the gym. I go, it's like happy feet. They're just moving for no reason. Yeah, like yes. it's just that's what I what was feeling. Like I'm not, I'm not saying this that I love Gilbert Burns. Obviously, I love Henry a lot. But it's almost like when I'm my I'm getting ready to feed my dog. She just starts, you know, she gets so fucking like she's prancing, or you know, and that's lucky, the energy. Yeah, lucky. Come on, you're gonna eat the two seconds. But Gilbert just had that. <laughs> 
those feet were booking yeah. and they weren't really going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, yeah. But that's what I felt anyway. But I yeah. think he makes that correction. I think he settles down a little bit and, you know, he could set up a lot of stuff way, way better. We don't pay you to be friends with everybody, right? I mean, you got to be able to be critical in some part. I mean, we all love Gilbert Durino yeah. Burns. I think no. he would acknowledge a lot of what you guys are saying, right? I was texting with Anthony Lionheart Smith last night, not trying to like peel back the curtain, but yeah. you know, he wasn't intending to be uber critical of Michael Venom Page, right? But he's an analyst and a strong one at that. And he's interesting. And, uh, you know, he's asked his opinion right after the fight, right? And, uh, you know, he gave it to the masses. Um, yeah. All right. So, Kenny, I just want to ask you, I don't know if you want to answer me in 20 seconds or so real quick. I know you touched on some of the mistakes Gilbert Burns made, but, you know, Jack Della Maddalena has good submissions in his own right. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu brown belt. Ben Vickers, Scrappy MMA, they do a good job. Like, I I am not an expert. I'm an amateur, but I was pretty impressed overall with his defensive grappling and his awareness and focus in those situations. No question about it. Looked looked way better than we saw in the past. And I know he's worked with Craig Jones, one of the best grapplers in the world right now. Uh, so I, I think, you know, you talk about his ability to, to keep his, motion, his emotions together and to execute the right techniques at the right time. Dude, he showed that he is a developing fighter, man. And if he continues to work on those skills and get better as a grappler, he's going to be a problem. Already is a problem for a lot of guys. Yeah. But that's one of those fights where you're going to come away with a lot more confidence. It's not like he was in there with Joe Schmo, uh, you know, striker guy on the ground. He was in there with Gilbert Burns, a, a legitimate Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt world champion. Um, so I think that he's going to gain a lot from that. And yeah, it was impressive. Yeah, I think he grows, like, again, tremendously. What I hope he doesn't do is think that because he survived with Gilbert Burns, he takes the foot off the gas pedal of right. that. He's got to keep going with that, keep getting better, and he's, he's he'll be a force to be reckoned with. Just great mindset. I mean, I, I got to meet him at the Apex during a way, and just a great great guy, great team around him, uh, all, all good stuff. So I'm really happy for him. So Jack Della Maddalena then calls out Shavkat Rachmanov, who is 18 and 0. And a lot of people express surprise that he would call out Shavkat Rachmanov. That includes the man who is probably going to book that fight. Sean Shelby, to my immediate right, looked at me and almost intimating, like, who calls that guy out? I would suggest to you guys, like anybody who wants to be a world champion does, right? And there's so much sportsmanship going on in this welterweight division from Shavkat Rachmanov and Jack Della Maddalena. Certainly, it's not out of the realm of possibility that both of those get a title fight next, depending on injuries and calendars and things like that. Jack Della is 7-0 in the UFC. Rachmanov has been on the short list for a while. But both of them acknowledge... <laughs> <laughs> right. They both acknowledge Bilal. And that's why Jack Della Maddalena is of a mindset that if I can get a main event or a co-main event against Shavkat Rachmanov and beat that guy, then I get a fucking shot at the world title. But right now, the way the landscape is, Jack knows he's not going to be next. So if you're really yeah. trying to put yourself in position to fight for the title, you, you, you beat the guy that's all the rage and that Shavkat, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, my, my point is, you know who does that? Real fucking people do that. Real people yeah. do that, not guys that take the number six guy. They call out the number six guy. That's not the mentality you want. You want this mentality, a guy that's not on TikTok, Wiki Walk, whatever the <laughs> fuck you want to call it. That's the guys that do that. That's the guys Wiki, I like. Wiki, look Wiki, at Wiki, And I'll say, and look at Marab for two or three weeks ago, making the fucking way to oh. get in that fight. That's a gangster fucking yeah. move. Like, you got to deal with that guy, a guy that would fight you without even a fucking fight camp. Right. Who, who just fought, who you know is going to have to kill himself to make the weight. That's the fucking mentality you want. Can we talk about that, Kenny and Ray, for a second? Right. So seemingly it was a difficult weight cut for the Cejudo fight. Perhaps not. But, you know, at some point during our fighter meeting, and that was just happened to happen at a time when yeah. Marab was particularly malnourished yeah. yeah and ray sort of gave us this motion to the yeah. neck like let's cut this thing off right yeah but this time around ray i mean that dude was belted in the goddamn room three <laughs> weeks later and made the weight again so yeah could we sit on that for a minute ray like what a fucking savage he looked yes. even better on the scale he did he did yeah why did yeah. he look better on the scale ray three weeks later I think, I, bless. I have no. I, I, my original, my my immediate response. I have no fucking idea. But <laughs> I would, I would imagine the excitement that he was maybe going to get to fight for the title. 
Yeah. Was enough to make him bounce all over the place. And again, it's all about mindset. And that's the mindset you want. That's what I say. The Jack Della Malalane is the, the Marabs. And these are guys that are there to fight. You know what I mean? That's it. And that's the, that's what you have to contend with. John, Cody's, we need to go offline. Go and, sorry, we need to go offline and talk to Ray about a Ray Longo app where he just kind of he says things like a couple lines every day that kind of motivates you for your right. day, like something like that. Like just hearing Ray gets yeah. me fired up. So uh, we need to talk about that, right? Hundred <laughs> percent. Well, yeah, you just hit a button and it'd be like TikTok, Wiki, Walk, yeah, yeah, exactly. Forget that, that noise that was a today, fucking dude. Move. I'm, so, I'll I'm punch so, a hole through his fucking chest, I'm like so, that. Like a, yeah. So fucking sick of this shit, candidates. I mean, <laughs> you know, look, and I'm gonna go look, it's it could be my age. I mean, I'll, I'm willing to say I'm even raw, but dude, I gotta tell you, it drives me insane yeah. how guys will put, you know, that shit before training. It right. just no, drives, I get it. drives me fucking crazy. Thankfully, Ray Longo loves mixed martial arts as much as anybody his age I know. So uh your guy, Mark Henry, hates MMA so much he didn't even show up in Caitlin Sermonara's <laughs> corner this past weekend. Sorry. Hey, hey, listen, Mark always said when Frankie was done, he was done. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I tell you, it's that, you know, like, again, he's a real guy, too. Yeah. No, he, he was listed, though, on the corner audio sheet, I believe, and then ended up not cornering. So maybe there's some circumstance there. I'm not trying yeah. to uh, be a dick. Uh, all right. Ray, I'm going to get you out of here on this, if that's OK. Piotr Jan is back. Beautiful. I mean, this dude, man, when he finds that proverbial flow state and gets pissed off, he gets pissed off about the tape on his glove. The next thing you know, he looks like the best band in weight in the world again. Uh, what did you think of Piotr Young? I, I guess it's nice when, uh, did I just call him Young? What did you think of Piotr Young? Must be nice to not be fighting Marab Dwalish Willie. Yeah. Well, first off, you know, I, I texted you during the fight. Oh, did you? He, what are you talking about? I'm going to look right now. Holy Busy shit. night. All I did but was you know fucking is, read ads Kenny, and promos. Anytime Jan did, it, Jan did anything, that guy was flopping to the floor. Like he could have went to scratch his leg. Right. Jan would have been down. So I texted John. He's selling out because Dean said he's selling out. He's selling out because he's got PTSD from the Marab fight. <laughs> right. Like any right. slight movement, he was all over the place. But as much as you know, there's been like a little cuckoo past with Jan. In the past, uh, I was really happy for him. You know, yeah. to see him come back. You know, after a couple of losses and to get a win, he's. I, I you know, he look. He's great for the division. Uh, he proved that. You know, that was a great fight for him. You knew they were going to bang it out, and uh, I'm, I'm actually happy for Jan. But man, you saw the residual, the residual uh, effect that that Marab fight had him on him. I mean, I'm telling you, if the guy sneezed or he went to fix his glove, that guy was right. sprawling. Like it right. was that, that's how Craig Kenny, right or wrong. I mean, you said, Dude, it was I, literally what I was thinking about. I'm like, this it, guy still thinks Marab's in front of him. Trying oh, yeah. to think him. I literally thought I mean, about like, he was on, he was on the floor. He wasn't even just biting a little bit. He was, yeah. uh, but yeah. I'm happy for PD on great win. Actually a great win. Great fight. Love the fight. Yeah. All right, man. Well, safe travels to uh, Las Vegas. We wish you all the best with Shara Lampos this weekend. So for UFC 300, I mean, can yeah. we put in a request for you to come out a little bit early? I'm going out on Tuesday, April 9th, not necessarily for recreational purposes, but uh, you know, maybe we all convene at the penthouse at the Virgin or something. Uh, let's, let's, uh, you tell me I'm there. All right. I'm there. So I'll see let's you, do, Ray. Uh, oh, you're definitely going to be there. Long. Yeah. Go. When let's... was the last time you and Ken Flo uh, made up? Uh, I think we swapped spit at the garden that time. No, <laughs> we did actually. I saw, yeah, yeah. It was the PFL event, I think. Yeah. I mean, listen, listen, first off, it's all normal today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so how's the setup? Pretty good. I mean, you sound fucking great. Oh man. You think, you think I'm, I'm doing better because of the setup? Is that possible? You're, you're, you had a really good the, show today. Objectively. Did. Really? Did. Really? Yeah, did. Today? Well, I think you're always great. I mean, there's a certain segment of our listenership that fast forwards to your segment. So, I mean, right. That should make you feel good, right? Time stamp the shit out of that. You understandably know? so, no? <laughs> Get him out of here. Get him uh, yeah. out of here. I, we're going to you right out of the room. I, do you ever listen to the show back, Raymond, or no? Uh, no, nah, not really. No, I mean, you're I, a media I, I like when they put the little clips up. That, that I catch. That's what why other? we have you on the show, honestly. Yeah. 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 What no, other no, no, 12 no. shows are you going to be on this week, Ray? 
No, no, nothing this week. Oh, I think right. I'm good. Right. I think I'm good this right. week. Uh, I try to help with, people, John. They're going with Eric Nixick this week, maybe. Uh, oh, we got to talk about that. We oh, got shit. About, you got two minutes? You got two I minutes? I got two minutes. Oh, Let's yes. do it. All right. I mean, Anthony Joshua. Woo. Anthony fucking Joshua. Ken Flo and I were watching this together, actually, um, in Miami uh, as Francis Ngannou is on the wrong end of an absolutely vicious knockout. Raymond, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm going to tell you, my this isn't going to make sense. And uh, I and I like Francis, obviously, and Nick Six a good dude. It there was a movie Humphrey Bogart was in called The Harder They Fall. It was about Primo Carnera, where they build up this yes. big Italian heavyweight, and they, they, the guy really thinks he could fight. I mean, you got the movie is fantastic if you want to go back and watch an old movie. But the first time he got in there with a legitimate guy, he just got the shit beat out of him. And it, and I'm not saying it was that, but, you know, I, the, the crossover fights, I'm, I'm going to even agree with Dana. That's uh, almost what should happen. And I, I'm going to tell you something. I give Francis credit because he fought a legitimate guy. You know, he's not doing a Jake Paul calling out a 60-year-old Mike Tyson or fighting, you know, you're 200 pounds, you're fighting a 140-pound Floyd Mayweather or something. It's just everything crooked. This guy literally fought a legitimate heavyweight. So hats off for Francis for that. But there are levels to that game, and I, I don't know how – like there was a time, like it, I think Chael Sonnen said something. You're not getting anybody to go in with like a Kale Sanderson that has minimal experience. You're getting killed. Like there's not, it's not even going to be close. And I think that's what it proved is that, you know, these different sports, uh, you know, take on a new life of their own. And that, that's why I even like a Demetrius Johnson, he lasted around with that uh, Rotang, you know what I mean? When he fought him and then he submitted him, but at least he gave that guy his chance to get him. And I, that's why I think Demetrius is one of the, you know, goats of all time, you know, for just even for things like that, putting himself out there in those positions. So hats off for Francis for taking a legitimate, legitimate fight. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it didn't work out, but I think that's kind of the way the universe should work. Ken Flo, I don't know if you saw the movie, The Harder They Fall, 1956. Ooh, great movie. I mean, is it black and white, presumably? A hundred percent. Black and white. Of course it is. I don't know when, you know, color TV was, was invented. What uh, year were you born? 2012? 1978. <laughs> Ooh, 78. I'm going to get Ken Flo's thoughts on Ngannou on the other side. We're going to let you get out of here. But yeah. if you do want to go to your local Blockbuster video, see if they have a hard copy of The Harder they fall from 1956. Uh, it, it won't disappoint you. Just like but, the Ray Longo minute every Ogie. week. Ogie at his best. Let's take hey, it Ray. easy, guys. I'll Thanks see you. Being here. We'll right. talk to you next I'll week. I'll see you at the Virgin. There yes, he is. Sir. Ray Longo with us every week here on the Anakin Florian podcast. Anthony Joshua, former Olympic gold medalist in boxing 2012. I'm a fan of this guy. When he's on and in an active competition cycle, he is outstanding. And man, did he put it on Francis Ngannou. I think there's a lot of truths in some of what Ray was saying. Um, and as much as I was rooting for Francis in this setting, Kenny, you know, part of me is rooting for the guys in their disciplines, in their sport, to show guys coming from other sports that there are levels to those sports, right? So this was a win for boxing in some part. Uh, what were your thoughts on on that pay-per-view as long as it lasted? Yeah, it certainly was. I, I mean, these are the risks you take when you fight a specialist at their own game. And this is also why Francis Ngannou got paid around $20 million plus for the fight because you can get hurt at this game. And John, you've shaken hands with Francis Ngannou. You've seen how big, how massive this dude is. Well, when you saw it the way in that Anthony Joshua was even bigger um, and you realize that he is a professional boxer who is a world champion, who knows how to throw punches, I started to get a little bit nervous. Now, Anthony Joshua, when he walked out there and even when he was competing, it seemed like he had this face of concern a little bit, but none of that really mattered. Once he established his jab, dude, he was just all over Francis Ngannou from the get-go. And here I am watching from the outside. So take this with a grain of salt. In my opinion, watching 
the difference between Francis Ngannou against Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou against Anthony Joshua. There were a couple things. First of all, I think we could all probably agree at this, this standpoint that that was not the best Tyson Fury that we have seen. Um, I also think that Francis Ngannou tried to fight Tyson Fury. Francis Ngannou in the Anthony Joshua fight tried to box Anthony Joshua. And that's where I think he ran into, ran into some issues. He fought him completely different than he fought Tyson Fury. Now, you're probably saying, well, Kenny, they're two different boxers. They're two different t- styles of fighters. Yes, but I think that he he went away from what made him successful against Tyson Fury. And because of that, it exposed him so much against a power puncher like Anthony Joshua. Tyson Fury is not a puncher, you know, a, a big puncher like Anthony Joshua. That is to be sure. But I, I think the style that he went out there with, I think he maybe overestimated his boxing skills a little bit too much and should have been employing a little bit more of what he was doing against Tyson Fury. But thankfully, Francis Ngannou got paid for that because those three punches could have ended the life of most men on this planet, yeah. John. I, I, it was very, very concerning. And to see him just literally melt to the floor after that last one, I, I, I'm so glad he was able to get back to his feet after that fight. Yeah, that was absolutely vicious. And I know Anthony Joshua, ever classy, talking about Francis Ngannou as an asset to boxing and hoping he sticks around. But uh, we'll see what is next for Francis Ngannou. I know what Hen and Fajeda would like to see next, and uh, that is Francis Ngannou in some sort of enclosed mixed martial arts setting. Kenny, a few more things I would like to get to on UFC 299. I don't know if you have anything else on Piotr Jan. I just want to say he's one of my favorite fighters to rally from that adversity in round one, staring potentially a four-fight losing streak in the face to do what he did in rounds two and three. Just an exceptional fighter who I think on any given Saturday night, if maybe Marab's not the guy staring across from him, he can beat any one of these guys, no? No question about it, and a lot of those losses were very were very close, right? Most of them, anyway. Um, and I think this was a great fight um, to show that he can he can perform at the highest level still. And if you're dealing with a four fight losing streak, uh, y- y- you have to be questioning a lot of what you're doing out there, and if this is for you, or if you're able to even get back, because you could argue. Uh, Although I still think he's elite, even if he lost that fight against Song, I think that um, there'd be an argument there for the UFC to go, do we need this guy in the division anymore? Can we get rid of him? Um, right? That's just facts. Five losses in a row, that, that's not a great thing. But he was able to go past that, get a win against a guy who was streaking in Song Yudong, a guy who was an excellent fighter. He got it done with skill. He got it done with intelligence. He got it done with toughness. And it's why I went with Piotr Jan. Jan, and really it was just kind of based on a feeling more than anything else because they were definitely very evenly matched. But I just had the feeling that Piotr Jan was going to come back and come back stronger in this one. Well, you know what? He might just fight our next guest at some point in the not too distant future. You just never know. But now with us on the guest line, a man who undeniably is going to have a number next to his name when the new UFC Bantamweight rankings come out this week. UFC Bantamweight contender, the Matrix, Kyler Phillips. My man. Appreciate the time. Up, Congratulations. Man? How are you? Doing good, man. Just uh, still out here in Miami hanging out. Dude, you are so good. Like, I don't know if you even watch it back or listen, right? But I think at some point we said on the broadcast, like, I'm not sure there's any greater statement about the depth of UFC 299 and also the depth of this Bantamweight division that, that, than that Kyler Phillips is fighting on the prelims and unranked right now, dude. So congratulations on a huge win. Ken Flo was watching at a bar in Miami. He was absolutely blown away. Um, I know you didn't put him away. Nobody puts Pedro Munoz away, but you got to feel on cloud nine, I would think, after turning in those 15 minutes, bro. Yeah, definitely, man. I, I had fun there, and I just uh, I can't wait to do it again. I had such a good time. I love what I do. So obviously you got a lot of momentum right now. Um, how quickly do you think you could actually spin this thing forward? And how quickly do you think you are approaching, you know, those guys like Piotr Jan and guys near the top? Uh, that's soon. That's very soon. Um, we'll find uh, a good matchup and let's, uh, let's get it going and fucking have me get up going with my career. So um, I just think uh, I just got to keep doing what I do and uh, keep working hard and, and, uh, it's an honor to do this. Kyler, there's a lot of guys who have a lot of skills out there. 
Um, but I think there's there's very few guys that can inject their their personality and to have a unique style uh, in the UFC. A lot of guys kind of look the same. You are definitely not like that. You definitely have a very unique style. How did you develop that? Uh, that just comes with a whole lifetime. It's like a real martial artist movie, you know, when they spend your whole life doing jujitsu from a young age and wrestling and judo and Muay Thai and boxing and mixing everything together and really uh, enjoying what you do and making it a flow and or making it organic, you know, and applying everything you know into the moment and applying yourself, your mentality and your style just comes, yeah, it comes with personality and it comes kind of just, uh, I, it's just an expression of, of my character and my being. And it's like a dance. It's like a fight. It's kind of like, you know, my, my primal self and also my mental self kind of just dancing with each other, fight, battling each other, and kind of trying to find that, that, uh, foundation and the, the, my center. And when I get to there, it just mixes all types of, of movements and, and, Faints and strikes and uh, styles, and it just all blends into one uh, really song or art form. And uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. That's beautifully said, man, and that is very apparent. Um, where would you rank Pedro Munoz win amongst your other wins at, at this stage of your career? I'm sorry, what was that again? Uh, where, where would you, where would you rank uh, the Pedro Munoz fight uh, at this stage of your career? Where would I rank it? Yeah, um, as far as your 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 I guess, favorite fights or your best wins? I would say for sure it's the best one just because I'm here and I'm now like whatever in the past happened, whether I was, you know, doing really good or not as well. Like, and in the future right now, I have this right here. And that, even that fight, it's, you know, even though it, it's over, you know, and um, take what I learned from it and had some fun. And I, I'm making some adjustments as well on some of the things that we, we need to tighten up. So, um, yeah, it's just a learning experience. And I, I think that this the other day just helped me get to a new level and unlock a, a new level of the matrix. That's a good way to put it. I do believe you unlocked a new level. Kyler Phillips with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. So I know there have been times in the past where you have spent extensive time with Sean O'Malley. So what is that relationship right now? How many rounds are you guys doing together? And uh, what did you make of his performance over the weekend as well? He looks so sharp, man. He looks so on point and sharp. And it was like almost, almost perfect, you know, the way he hits and kind of like, like keeps his range. And it's like, just the right amount of of range and just the right amount of pop and power enough where and that knee was you know damn near perfect and just switching stances stances and angling off in the way he kind of just cuts the corner and then he started to like play a little bit in there and it's cool to be around that you know i see him at the gym and we we train with each other all the time and you know we're with takino mendez and um and tim welch and stuff and so we gotta move around and uh it's just being around it, you know, and uh, I love being around and we can kind of bounce off ideas and stuff like that. And I have other teammates as well, like Marcus McGee and um, and uh, Mario Batista. We kind of yeah. just you see what they're doing and different things that they're working on in their camps. And you see how they're going in their character and their style. And you can kind of like just be around that and it just feeds ideas and everybody kind of just blends together and we just iron sharpens iron it is not out of the realm of possibility though that all three of you guys mario bautista sean o'malley and of course kyler phillips are in the top five in the not too distant future now thankfully there are a lot of big scalps for you to chase beyond that um but you're just such a centered guy, and I do want to ask you about your brothers in a little bit, but it doesn't seem like you're either in any great rush to like call out big names necessarily. Um, but now it's like everything's in front of you, right? Like it's not out of the realm of possibility that Marlon Chido Vera or Piotr Jan or one of these guys shows up in your bracket. So um, is there a realistic possibility that there's a name I mentioned that could be next? And, and realistically, what is your calendar in terms of the rest of 2024? Uh, I definitely want to get two more fights, you know, so All right. if I can get two more, that would be awesome. And yes, I take, I got to go up. I'm, my goal is to get the belt. I'm going to be UFC champion. So I got to take those fights. So yeah, man. Well, well and good. hopefully when your time comes that maybe Sean ain't the champion, cause I don't want you guys to have to kick each other in the face, but bro, the stylistic 
matchup between you Oof. two. I mean, maybe I'll just have to attend sparring or something. It's so fun. Yeah, it's fun to watch. It's so, it's fun to watch him too, man. Like, and how much he's grown. Like, he's always been so flashy and stuff. And like, but I've known him since I was 18 years old, you know, and we went to the lab and like, we didn't have nothing, you know, we had nothing. Me, him, Mario, we had nothing. No job, no really yeah. career and just a dream. And we were just, you know, we just had fun with it though. And like, I think that's like one of the most important things is to really enjoy what you do and you really do it, enjoy it the way you do it, you know, and not wanting to be in somebody else's shoes and whether you have a dollar or a million dollars or whatever, a belt, no belt, you're going to just still have that gratitude and expression of your soul of you just being you, you know, because that's all you got is you. It's not like when you wake up and you look in the mirror, it's not somebody else. Like you have to live with that person and you have to respect that person. You have to outgrow that person and be big brother, little brother to yourself, you know, and you got to tell the, the younger, smaller version of yourself, Hey, like cut that out, do this and kind of big brother him. And then also you just listen to your big brother self and you know, it's that relationship within yourself. And you see it with guys like Sean and you see how much they commit to shadow boxing and commit and they spend time in separate areas in their life. And you see how it definitely puts shine into things and it makes you want to be better. So, um, yeah, it's just cool to be around like-minded people. Well, dude, we're tracking your every move. If you want to follow this man on Instagram, it is at Kai matrix K Y matrix. So to what extent are your brothers still aspiring martial artists, by the way? My little brother, Cameron, he is 17 years old. Uh, so he's about to graduate high school. I think he's going to wrestle. And then he's going to be a problem. He's got 4.6 GPA, though. Oh, and wow. I don't, you know, my wow. mom doesn't want him to fight as much, but he's actually a lot more, not just talented and skilled as when, when I was at that age, but he is able to skip a lot of lessons that I had to learn as a big wow. brother. You know, not skip, but kind of, you know, okay, I don't have to learn this over and over and over again. He's like, okay, this is some traps. This is what happened. This is how you can do it. So he gets to kind of leap ahead. Plus, he's so hardworking. He's committed. And he's bigger than me, actually. He's probably 180, 190. So he could be a welterweight if he grows a little bit bigger. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he became a UFC champion. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, dude, we're going to be tracking your... What so division? I, I got two other brothers. Yeah, I got so Cole were the kid kids. Con Tyler, my big sister Kalani, and then right. Connor, Cole, and Cameron. And my little or my grandpa had a boat called the K Kids boat because my cousins were Keenan and Kelsey, and then they just kept the the K's because they didn't want to sell the boat. Oh, yeah. so I'm gonna I go love it. Actually visit him. He lives in Florida. Nice. Man. Well, dude, congrats. Enjoy the win. What weight class is Cameron going to compete at? Too early uh, I'm not to sure. say. Yeah, he's 17. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not right. sure. We'll go. Yeah. Hey, well, we appreciate the time, man. Congrats on a huge win and uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Florida. And uh, we'll be anxiously awaiting those rankings later today, buddy. Congratulations. Thank you. John Kenny. Congrats. See you, brother. Guys. There he is, Kyler Phillips, UFC Bantamweight contender, joining us here on the Anakin Florian podcast at Kai Matrix, K Y M A T R I X on Instagram. Yeah, Kemflo, dad took him to uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy when he was like three years of age. And uh, certainly proud parents doesn't even begin to describe it. But dude, like he's got the right disposition to be in a division that is that deep and that ruthless. Because I think a lot of guys at his stage would, you know, get a little bit impatient. And it's like, dude, you look at all the guys. Uh, it's just a true murderer's row. And that's why when you have a champion like Sean O'Malley, um, setting the tone for this division. Uh, it's just going to be on fire. You're just not going to have a, a belt that's being defended every three months. That's it. No question about it, dude. And he's surrounding himself with a lot of great fighters. Obviously, Sean O'Malley. You're going to learn some stuff being in a room with those guys. So uh, Kyler's a tremendous martial artist. Always love watching him fight. Um, he looks like he's better than ever, man. I can't wait to see where he goes. All right, congratulations to Kyler Phillips on his big win at UFC at 299. We can go three wide with Petrie anytime he's ready, but I do want to talk about Curtis Blades and Jailton Almeida. Hey, at Brian Petrie MMA, <laughs> nickname Big Gun. That's right. How we doing? I'm doing well, buds. How you guys doing? God, Kyler's deep, huh? 
Yeah, Good dude. Zen, bro. Like, big yes. brother, little brother yourself. I love that. That was cool. Yeah, Ken Flo knew how to uh, tap into that side of Kyler Phillips. But it's good to see you. We love when we get a chance to talk to you on Monday and we do a longer show like this. Oftentimes, we don't talk to you until midweek. Um, but I did want to say real quickly before we get to Curtis Blades and Jailton Almeida. So, you know, one thing as a broadcaster for 20 years or so, you're constantly looking for different ways to say the same thing. And I remember early on in my UFC career, you know, I was told you can't say cage, right? So we say the word octagon a lot, but you're always looking for different words. Kenny can certainly attest to this, right? So Jack Della Maddalena, Giacomo, Jack Della Maddalena. You can't always say Della Maddalena. Mm-hmm. So Brian Petrie came up with three named Jack. So I'm on the post fight show. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you saw this, Brian, but I, I call him three named Jack. And mm-hmm. Shale Sonnen later acknowledges that. And I didn't have a chance to pay that off on those airwaves that the originator of that outstanding nickname, three name Jack is none other than Brian Petrie. So I figured I would pay it off on these lesser airwaves here today. Yeah, it was very nice. Listen, it's, it's, it's a nice little wink to your boy, you know, you're professional, you know, I, I don't need to get credit, but when you say it, we know where it came from. The All OGs right. know it came from a and right, good. And uh, it's just a nice little wink. Yeah. I saw it, man. That was cool. All right. So I'm going to start with Ken Flo, if I could on Curtis blades and Jailton Almeida, because Matt returns or takedowns, whatever they were, Curtis Blades seemed absolutely fine with whatever Jailton Almeida was doing, Kenny, in round one. Just was looking at the clock like, you know, I'm going to get you at some point in time. Kind of wish we had 25 minutes as initially scheduled, but I'll get you in 15 if I have to. lot to unpack here, I think, on both sides, Kenny. But what are your thoughts on Curtis Blades uh, getting a huge win in the featured prelim at 299? He he did. He did. And and I think, um, you know, it it was demonstrated that Jailton Almeida – wasn't as efficient with his wrestling as he should have been and also wasn't thinking in terms of adjusting. Sometimes you see that leg and you're like a dog on a bone. You're like, I'm getting this thing. I'm not letting go by any means. I'm just going to hold on. And then you realize that it's MMA and you can get elbowed and punched and all that stuff. And I think he got, he had his blinders on a little bit Mm -hmm. and was so committed to the single leg that he forgot that punches do matter and, and got stuck there and actually had some success in round one, right? Like he won round one. No, no question about it. He was all over Curtis blades. He had the ability to take the back. Wasn't quite able to secure it and stay there. Um, and, and that was all because of Curtis blades and his ability to stay composed and, and defend. Um, but uh, I, I think he just, a couple things, he lost composure and, and let the lack of experience get the better of him there. Brian, what'd you think of the heavyweights? Yeah, I mean, kind of the same thing with Almeida. I mean, Curtis Blades weathered the storm round one, didn't look too bothered by it, and came out and said, hey, I'm going to put hands on this guy. And Almeida, again, he just had one one track mind. I'm going to wrestle, grapple this guy. There's no punches. There's nothing setting everything up. And then he held on to the leg. There was a nice little short little kind of uppercut, which was really cool by Curtis. That kind of froze Almeida. And then, I mean, Curtis Blades' hands are this this big, so you're going to get a couple inside the head. You're going to feel it. Um, but yeah, I just wish Almeida would mix it up more. He's just such a one track minded guy that, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was, it was, um, I picked Almeida. I didn't bet the fight, so I, I didn't have confidence, but good for Curtis Blades. That's a big win for him. All right. I'm going to throw a couple other names at you guys and you can go in any direction you want. Sometimes they say when it comes to podcasting, like leave them wanting more, less is more, right? Like I truly believe we could do a three hour recap on UFC 299. Like you think I'm not going to talk about fucking Robellus to Spain today? Like I don't care about the rest of your respective days. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. You know, I mean, certainly you can argue some favorable matchmaking here. A lot of people loved him in the spot against Josh Parisian, who maybe has seen better days, but, uh, we could talk about fucking to Spain. We could talk about Michelle Pereira. Like, does anybody want to give this fucking dude a modicum of credit for winning seven consecutive fights in the UFC across two divisions? Maybe Wonder Boy and other people would scoff at that because of the weight miss, but he's a problem. Mataj Gamrot just doing what he does. Macy Barber's won six in a row, Bry. I mean, what a fucking show for the combat sports leader, huh? Unbelievable. I mean, I, you could talk about all those. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Macy Barber. She looks fantastic. Robellus to Spain. This dude's <laughs> this dude's scary, man. His chest is huge. He's six seven. Uh, needs to clean up some things, but doesn't matter. He touches you, you die. It's crazy. He's unbelievable. I love the dyed hair as well. Uh, I, I want to see more of this kid for sure. Uh, Matus Gamrod fought excellent, high pace as always. 
Um, but yeah, Macy Barber is 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 one that to me, I think a lot of people slept on her in this fight because you know, Seminara, Chikagian, it's just known to win fights like that. Yeah. And Macy in in tight in the clinch was mean and brutal in there. And I thought everyone's like, oh, Macy's got a takedown and win. I didn't think so. I thought Macy could win in this style fight, and she did. And again, I think she got written off after the knee injury after Roxy. She's back. This is a girl I think everyone needs to watch. I'm definitely watching her. Uh, so big props to Macy Barber. Well, and you're Bellas, wise. Man, he's scary. Bro. But you are wise to use the bulk of your time on Macy Barber. Ken Flo, yeah. she had essentially a total foot reconstruction in advance of this fight, a bunionectomy. My mom had two of them. Nothing <laughs> pleasant about it, right? But yeah, man, just one of the meanest, nastiest fighters in any men's or women's division. And, and needless to say, a huge win for her over a very game and motivated and in shape, Caitlin Sermonara. That was a huge win for her over Caitlin. And she went about it the way that I thought that she should, which was be your aggressive self, get in, get in her face and, uh, and land a lot of short shots, elbows, knees. And it was just relentless pursuing the takedown. Um, her conditioning is a weapon, man. And, mm. and I think now that it's meshed with her experience and her confidence and her skills, she's getting the wins because of that. She's getting the consistency because of that. So that was uh, yet another win to build from and, and to elevate her status in that division. Uh, and to Spain, dude, I mean, I wanted to call 911. I'm like, yeah, yeah there's a uh, six foot seven dude who's moving <laughs> like a uh, lightweight cat in the octagon right now. Uh, yeah. We need to stop him. Uh, but like, who can move backwards and throw shots with that level of Crazy. speed? Like it's it's a rare skill for a lightweight to have, let alone a guy who's six foot seven and a heavyweight. Did I get his height right, by the way? Yeah. But like it, his speed is just unbelievable. That is a cat dude, and I'm really curious to see uh, how he does in some of these striking matchups in the future. But uh, a unique talent for sure. We also congratulate Asu Almabayev. Looks like one of the better wrestlers in that flyweight division. CJ Vergara missing weight again, which is not a good sign for him, but he's tough as hell in defeat. Joanne Wood going out with back-to-back -back wins, yes. an amazing finish to her UFC career. But just notice that I said Macy Barber, Mataj Gamrot, Robelis de Spain, and Michelle Pareda. And I sort of threw in there that nobody wants to give him a modicum of credit. Now, I don't know if it's because the fan base doesn't like him. I don't know if they don't like that he can fucking bat backflip off a moving scale at the ceremonial way. And, but Kenny, dude, he's a, a hulking figure at 85, even hulks over like the champion Drake is Duplessis won seven straight fights. Uh, you know, I hope he gets a big fight because he's going to be competitive in it. I would think. Yeah. I, I did not mean, mean to ignore him. No, I know. I, know. I, I think he's, you know, but it's a great point though. I, I do think he should get more credit because he's a fantastic creative striker who I think is in the right division now. So mm -hmm. because of that, I think we'll see more of those energy filled performances. He seems to electrify the arena anytime he's in there. Um, and I think he's found a nice balance between being reckless and being creative. Um, right now at this stage of his career. That's where the experience comes in. And uh, I can't wait to see more of him, man. He, he really is a fun fighter to watch. All right. That is going to put a wrap on UFC 299. The only other winner we did not congratulate, Felipe Lins. Well done, Monstro. The winning ways continue. Big night across the board for American top team. But we got to spin it forward. UFC fight night, Tui Vasa versus Tabora. Number nine versus number 10. In the UFC heavyweight division, we do have a couple pronunciations of the week, though, on the front of our selections. And don't forget, of course, we close out the program with Place Your Bets. Our first pronunciation of the week, yeah. nicknamed GM3. He kicks off the main card on ESPN Plus against Brian Bam Bam Barbarina. Barbarina featured previously on this pronunciation of the week segment. GM3, Bri, yeah. how do you pronounce his last name? You can give me Gerald, too. Gerald Mearshart is what I'm going to go with. All right, let's hear Gerald pronounce his name. Mearshart. Oh, full name, please. Oh, Gerald Mearshart. And a couple of slow ones. Gerald Mearshart. Gerald Mearshart. Murr. Frankincense and Murr. 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 Yeah. Like Murr. Frank Murr. Double E's get you. So uh, Brock Lester used to pronounce his name. Frank Murr. Yeah. Well, hopefully nobody goes on television and calls him Gerald Mearshart this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe there are a lot of people that don't watch the Anakin Florian podcast. We'll I don't see. know what to tell you. I'm going to get fired. All right. 
<laughs> Gerald oh, Marchand is the first one, the second pronunciation of the week. And we don't even need this guy's first name either. His first name's Kennedy. He fights in a main card matchup in the light heavyweight division against former world title challenger Ovin St. Preux. Kennedy is a big man from Nigeria. I think he's 6'5", trains out of Fortis MMA. And as much as I wanted to hear Brian pronounce Tiago Moises or Josiani Nunes, a couple of Brazilian sure. Portuguese names, uh, we wanted to give you Kennedy this week, Bryce. So what do you have for us? So... I butcher this name all the time and it, it, it scared me today. This is the closest I ever came to cheating because I butchered this so bad. Oh boy. Here we go. Just for last. Why not? We're with the boys. Um, Kennedy and Zet Chukubu. It's pretty close, Brian. Yeah. And I will say you can always email Heidi Dean. If you want to cheat, okay. she'll send you the audio file. Okay. I don't want to cheat. I don't want to cheat, but. It was pretty close, but let's hear the, uh, the dulcet tones of Kennedy and Zet Chukubu. Kennedy Zichu. Kennedy Zichu. In Zechiku. Yeah. Locked in. Locked Maybe in. an extra right. syllable, but Kennedy and Zechiku competing this weekend. So uh with that, we will get to the selections. Today's main event challenge is presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, we will begin with the main card opener on ESPN Plus. In the middleweight division, Gerald Mershart minus 192, Brian Barbarina plus 160. So GM3, the betting favorite here, Brian, he buys to end a two-fight losing streak. He's 10-9 and nine in the UFC. Last fight split decision loss to Andre Petrovsky at UFC 292. On the other side, you got Bam Bam. Similar UFC mark, 9-9. Nine and nine. Hasn't fought since a unanimous decision loss to Mahmoud Muradov last July. BP forced to make a selection. You going GM3 or uh, Brian Bam Bam Barbarina? Not sure why Barbarina hopped up to 85. I, mean, I can understand why Michelle Pereira did it because he's enormous. I mean, he was bigger than Ola Shechek, who was a 205er. Um, don't sure why Barbarina did it. You know, he he got out man against Murdoff last time out. 13 takedowns, which is horrible. Um, his takedown offense is is bad. His ground game's okay. He's not like a super uh in dangerous on the ground. You know, he's trying to stay active off his guard, but when you enter GM3, this guy. The most submission wins at 185 pounds, or at least that was a record he held at one point. The guy's smooth on the ground. His takedowns aren't the best in the world. His wrestling is, is obviously, it's there. His striking sets up his takedowns, which would be nice. And Barbarina invites people to come hit him so he can counter. Uh, but I think GM3, this is, this is just, I mean, this number seems low to me. I, I'm going to play prop. I'm going to go by submission as well, but I'm, I'm going to take GM3. I just think he's too big, too strong, too good on the ground. Uh, and Barbarina is just going to get smothered in this fight. Ken Flo, Brian Barbarina has lost three straight since that memorable run in 2022, of course, in which he uh, got past legends Matt Brown and Robbie Lawler. Big fight for him here. Main card opener on ESPN Plus. You going Barbarina or Mershart? Ken Flo. Ba, 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 <laughs> Baran. Um, listen, uh, yeah, I, I don't love the move to 185 pounds uh, for Brian Barbarina. I, I think it's tough, and, and I don't love the matchup, if I'm being candid. I think Brian has struggled with submission-based grapplers in the past, and Mearshart is just that. However, he can't let Brian make it a nasty scrap. That's where he thrives. Like, he's got that Dustin Poirier-type mindset. It's like, let's make it ugly, let's make it nasty. I'm going to come out of this. So, Mearshart... Mershart, sorry, needs to be very intelligent. I think he can do that. He needs to make it technical. He needs to be patient. And uh, I think he can get the sub here. Somebody said to me this week, like, oh, you surround yourself with like nice guys, guys who are nicer than you are, like your twin brother, super sweet. And Kenny is like the nicest guy in the world. That dude <laughs> is not <laughs> nice. If you're watching on the DraftKings YouTube channel, oh, this dude's God. a fucking prick. Dude. You know, I mean, looks like a spoiled high school kid out of Dover, Sherburn. Mom, mom, I'm not going to take my Boston Herald All-Star photo, mom. Kenny, get in the car. Get in the car. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, dude. I don't know why that uh, just dawned. I mean, Peachy's a super you. nice guy. Like, holy I'm not holy, <laughs> inherently mean, just calling it like it is. All right, women's bantamweight division. Kenny and I have been here for two hours. Screws uh, are starting to come loose. Huh? All right, Macy Chasson, minus 170. Panny uh, Kianzad, plus 142. It's a rematch. This is why we're picking this fight. Mm -hmm. It's a rematch of the Tough 28 final, won by Chess on November 30th, 2018. Macy has five more wins in the UFC since that point in time. You like her, you like her here this weekend, Briar? What? Yeah, I love me. I was high on Macy when she came off the Ultimate Fighter, and, and she won 
tough. Uh, I think she's very, very, very talented. Still is. She's getting better, but very ups and downs, ups and downs. I mean, she was beating Irene Aldana, or at least being very competitive until that up kick liver shot, which was a beautiful shot. Um, and she, you know, her grappling is 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 becoming great. Her takedowns, at least, are becoming great. She needs to become a finisher. Panty's never been finished in the UFC. I think if Macy wants to take that next step, you got to finish Panty here. It's a rematch. Got a little history with each other. You got to look for a finish. I look for a submission here from Macy. I like Macy. I like her length. I like everything about her. Um, this is going to be a turn in the corner fight. I think she needs to be a little more consistent, get a finish here, and then, you know, gates are open for you. I like Macy. Kenny Macy Shass on the minus 170 betting favorite on DraftKings Sportsbook right now. Canceled bouts against Giannis Santos. That was July of 2023. And then Ketlin Vieta had to withdraw from their matchup January of this year. So her last fight was actually that knockout loss all the way back at UFC 279, September of 2022. Your thoughts on the returning Chass on here against Panny Kianzet? Yeah, been around 18 months since we last saw Macy in the octagon. And uh, of course, it's been a long time since she fought Panny back in 2018, where she won by by rear naked choke in, in round two. I, I, I think it's um, it, it should be a very different fight. Um, but for me, when I'm when I'm breaking down this fight, I, I think it's kind of simple. I, I think Macy probably has the better skills, but more than anything else, that height and reach advantage is going to be significant. Panny at five foot seven, Macy all of five foot 11 is going to use it. And I think it all comes down to uh, Macy and and her mindset coming into this fight. Is she going to be aggressive yet composed? Sometimes we see her aggressive, but not very composed or, or vice versa. So I think that um, if we see Macy at her best, I think it's a relatively easy fight. If she's not at her best, I think it's going to be a really close fight where Panny can maybe steal a round or two. So she's got to be on point here. But I like Macy Chasson here as well. I think she takes it. All right. How's everybody? Good, good, good. All right, at Featherweight, the Midwest Choppa, Isaac Dolgarian, minus 130, Christian Rodriguez, plus 110. So Dolgarian, I've never met the man. He's undefeated, 6-0, and as many finishes. Stopped Kurt Pellegrino's guy, Francis Marshall, in his UFC debut last August. Factory X, that's a feather in his goddamn mm-hmm. cap. But now he draws C-Rod, who has some serious momentum. Three straight wins, the last two of which have come against highly touted young prospects. Of course, Raul Rosas Jr., Cameron Simon. He did miss weight for the Cameron Simon fight, so the scale bears watching on Friday. But uh, a big close fight here seemingly at featherweight, Bri. You like the Midwest Choppa or you like Christian Rodriguez? I'm smelling a rat. I smell a rat. <laughs> Isaac Dolgarian looked fantastic against Francis Marshall. Finished him in the first round. Problem is, is all six of his or five of his other wins are finishes in the first round, too. We ain't seen this guy in the second round yet. We haven't seen him in the third round. He's not going to steamroll C-Rod. He's just not. C-Rod is a very good prospect who's beat, knocking off all these young guys. Rojas Jr., Cameron Simon, he's a young guy himself. He's tagged by Anthony Pettis, Sergio Pettis, Duke Rufus. He's that guy. You're hanging plus 110 on me. I like C-Rod here. I think if he gets out of the first round, which he will, he'll control with some grappling. He'll pick him apart with the striking. And I don't think Dolgarian, even though he comes from a great camp, when you have all these wins in the first round, it's going to fuck with you in your mind going, I'm halfway through the second. I can't put a dent in this kid. Yeah, I have cardio, but maybe my body's playing tricks on me. I like C-Rod here. I love the plus number. This is a this is a big bet for me in my personal life as well. Give me Christian Rodriguez for sure. Big bet in his personal life as well. How about that? Let's go. Ken Flo, Isaac Dolgarian, minus 130. Christian Rodriguez, plus 110. Any thoughts on this one? Okay, I'm going to try not to poop on Brian's party oh, here. No. Oh, no. Um, but it, I guess it's something to consider, right? Because okay. C-Rod uh, is a savage. He's got a skill set that you cannot doubt. I don't doubt his skills. I don't doubt his experience. I don't know any of that. This fight's at 145. It's not at 135 pounds. Now, probably rightfully so, because the guy couldn't make 135 pounds. The UFC doesn't like when you make weight, let alone not make weight two two fights in a row. So that is my concern. Dolgarian's kind of a big 45er, not a massive one, but a decent sized 45er. And Christian is not really a big 35er. So Mm -hmm. that's the concern for me. And perhaps Dolgarian is just that good that no one can go past five minutes. That is another concern. Now, if he does, I think that's where Christian Christian Rodriguez can test him, right? Um, Is getting him into foreign territory because Christian, from what I've seen, 
has shown more skill. There is no question about that. That cannot be denied. But I do think Dolgarian is a decent striker as well. And, it, and you know, I guess the last one, um, and again, there's a small subset of what we're looking at here. He didn't look exhausted, didn't look tired. It seemed like he was kind of just getting started. So, and just based on what he has said about his career, he's taken this very seriously. This dude's a serious dude. Um, and, uh, you know, his past wrestling career indicates that. I think from what I've seen from MMA uh, in his interviews, it seems like it indicates that. So I'm leaning towards Dolgari in here just because of that new weight class for C-Rod. If C-Rod's able to pull it off, man, I hope he wins this one and then goes right back to 35 and gets his nutrition in order. Nicely done, Ken Flo. Nice. I do wonder if it was a promotional push to 45 or if Christian Rodriguez went up mm. willingly. Yeah. Perhaps that answer is out there. All right. That brings us to a featured bout at 205 pounds. Kennedy in Zechiku minus 500. Oven St. Pru is plus 380. 27th UFC appearance for St. Pru. He fought John Jones for the title back at UFC 197. That was April of 2016. And now he will end a year plus layoff against Inzechiku, who is out of the rankings now, Bri. He had that stoppage loss to Dustin Jacoby last August, had won three in a row going in. So a big spot for the Nigerian, the General Safe Saud trained Kennedy and Zechiku. Your thoughts on him here, Bri, is a five to one favorite. Might be the last time we see OSP. You know what I mean? Might be. It might be. It might be that time. Um, big fan of OSP. You know, I love the, uh, you know, just, you know, he does a little Texas or Tennessee thing. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, I just think Kennedy, I mean, usually I, I crap on five, five to one lines. I'm like, oh, you got to find value. And maybe there's value in OSP. I mean, Kennedy sometimes comes in, closes the distance a little too much with his range. He gets clipped. That's kind of what happened when the J Dustin Jacoby fight he's done in, in, in other fights as well. But if he stays at the end of his punches and he uses his range like he can do, he's going to do some damage. He's got big power. His ground game's working well. I don't want to see him forced to take down. His cardio's elite working with safe side there. You know, they're getting that right. Um, I see Kennedy winning. I see Kennedy winning by knockout with, within round one or two here, unfortunately. Um, and, yeah, I, that's that's how I'm going to play it. I won't touch money line, but I will touch Kennedy by by knockout within the first two rounds. Ken Flo, Kennedy, and Zechiku, minus 500. The comeback on OSP, plus 380. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think Kennedy will definitely still need to be careful, but I think his forward pressure and the general lack of volume from OSP when he is moving backwards is going to hurt him. So I think it's a good matchup because of that for Kennedy. So give me and Zechiku. Co-main event, Brian Battle, minus 142. Anj Losa is plus 120. Battle... Wasn't all that active, but he had about as good a 2023 as you could have. Ken Flo was there for his knockout of Gabe, Gabe Green. That came 14 seconds into his fight in front of his home crowd there in Charlotte, North Carolina. Then in September, he submitted that bulldog, A.J. Fletcher. Now he draws Losa out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's won two in a row and a nice showcase for both of these welterweights getting the Co-main event status, if not the poster treatment. Brian Petrie, any lean here? Battle the favorite, Los of the dog. Listen, we're all heterosexual, heterosexual men on this podcast, but we appreciate the male physical form. And Angelosa, this dude is <laughs> fucking jack. This guy, and he doesn't, he, he's got the beast muscles, but he doesn't slow down. You know, he went, yeah. he went three hard rounds with three named Jack, almost had him in an arm triangle on the contender series, dropped that fight, and has won two in a row so far, and has looked really good. He has stuffed a lot of takedowns and landed takedowns himself. I see that's what he's going to have to do here because Brian Battle's a long, rangy guy. He's got great head kicks. I mean, he'll put you out with a head kick. It's powerful. He's getting better as well. Every time I see him, it's a new version of him. When he was in the Ultimate Fighter, he was just a grappler, a sloppy grappler, but that got him by. Now, adding these strikes and in the, in, in the fact that he is long and lengthy um, over Angelusa, I think that's going to be a good, a good thing here for Brian Battle. I like Battle big here. Luce hasn't been finished. You know, I don't know if he can be finished. The guy's built. But um, if Brian Battle gets slips in a head kick in there, that's going to look pretty good because the last time Luce fought a guy as tall or similar height as a uh, a Brian Battle was Reese McKee, and Reese McKee lost that fight. But Reese McKee had some success. When it became a dogfight, Reese was landing. I think if Brian Battle lands some of his shots, it's going to be a problem. I think he can stuff the takedowns as well. Um, give me Brian Battle here. Kenny Bryan battle the minus one, 142 betting favorite. Angelosa, the underdog, plus 120. Which way are you going? 
Yeah, that's why Brian's a shot mind. Uh, I agree, dude. I, I think Anja's last win over uh, Riz McKee, I think, was a nice prep for this fight against the taller Brian Battle. It's not easy to deal with someone with that kind of reach advantage. However, I think Losa's speed and athleticism advantage will be able to overcome uh, that length disparity. So um, I-, I like Losa here as well. Ooh. All right, final act, heavyweight well, main know, event. Who, excuse me, John, who did I did, did I say? I picked Battle, right? Yep. Okay. Oh, you went and, with battle. I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought you were yeah going that's why I confused me. I was, like, I was like, wait a second. What did I say? Sorry, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. No, you took sorry, battle. Bro. You sorry, did sorry, say sorry. some really nice things about uh, how good Los well, looks true. naked, I think Jeez, you said boy. in there. I, yeah, I, I think I faded off and just started imagining gotcha, Los's gotcha. body. That's, yeah, that's right. on me. Just that's on me. Yeah, right. Sorry. Like, he didn't he? Was, right. Yep. <laughs> All right. Number nine, Tai Tuivasa. Minus 130. We got two fucking Bam Bams on this card. Is that the deal? Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tied to Ivasa, minus 130. He's number nine in the world. 10th ranked Marcin Tabora, plus 110. Tabor is 38 years old. Mm-hmm. Still competitive. He's won two of his last three, but he is coming off that absolute pasting at the hands of Tommy Aspinall, 73 seconds into their fight last July. To Ivasa, an interesting case, right? Mm-hmm. Shuey authority. He won five in a row. Now he's lost his last three to Cito Gan, Sergei Pavlovich, and Alexander Volkov. Loser here likely never fights for the title. I guess Tui Vasa could rebuild. He's only 31. Um, but if Tabora is going to make one last push, I would think this is one he's got to have. So BP, we mm-hmm. will need a selection per Evan Longoria on every main event. Tied Tui yeah. Vasa minus 130, Marcin Tabora plus 110. You, you took, I mean, they both got to have it, right? Tybora yeah. has really kind of eased. He's been in the UFC since 2016, which is crazy. Um, he's got to really ease into, uh, he's really eased into what his game plan is. And that's get you, get you down and get you on top. I want to use my ground and pound. I want to use my size and put it on you. That's a great game plan against Ty because we haven't seen Ty and we, we have seen Ty do it and he does, he struggles against it. But Ty has a whole camp dedicated to him. There's no excuse for him not to be prepared for a guy like Morsin Tabora. Because on the feet, Tybor's got a great front kick. He's long, he's lanky, but he's crackable, right? Ty, you know, he's been put out before, and Ty can put some people out. He's explosive. He's more athletic than you, what you would think with his body type. So all the pressure's on Ty, and I think he's going to deliver. I wish this was in front of a crowd because I think he would perform a little bit better. But, man, I, I like Ty big in this spot. I'm going heavy in real life. Again, personal life. And a promise is, I don't know if they want to see it on these airways. I haven't drinking a beer in 10 years. Just not something I do. I'll do a fucking shoey if he loses, okay? Wow. I'll do a shoey, shoey on air if my guy loses. Whatever beer you guys want me to do. I was just going to say, I don't want it to be an O'Doul's non-alcoholic no, 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 beer. No, no, no. All right. I have no problem with alcohol. It just okay. has a problem with me. Um, but uh, I like Tai Tuivasa big here. I'm going to go... Multi units on uh, Tai Tuivasa. Wow! I think, he, I think he knocks him out as well. I think he knocks out Tybora. All right. So if Marcin Tibora wins, Brian Petrie is going to have his first <sighs> beer in over a decade right here on the Anakin hey, Florian podcast. Wedding, We're going to make it a fucking docky too. I drank at my wedding, so it was my wedding when when I wow. went 20, 2015. So not wow. Quite Does Erica years. know you're making beer bets on the podcast? Yeah, she'll probably pour okay. it for me. She's so excited. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ken Flo, we will need a selection on the main event right now on DraftKings Sportsbook. Tied to Ivasa, the minus 130 betting favorite. Oh, my goodness. Brian. I have some interesting news for you. All right, here we go. No, no. Listen, this is a close one. There's no question about it. But if it's a big grappler that can also strike, then you're going to feel a bit worried for Tui Vasa, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And I love Tui Vasa. He's a likable dude. He's a tough warrior. But he's also been in a lot of wars. And there's a lot of inconsistency. So you're like, okay. If we get the best tie to Ivasa, yeah, I could see him knocking out Tybora. If he's not uh, in a great spot, if he gets in some trouble, that's where Tybora with that unorthodox game can pose some problems. And I don't know. I mean, he's seven and two in his last nine fights. Like, that's mm-hmm. not bad. And look at the guys that he lost to. Um, you know, what is it? Volkov by decision. And then he lost to Tommy Aspen. That's it. There's, yeah, no yeah. Sh- there's no shame in that at all. Right. So, um, you know, Ty is a very dangerous striker, um, and I, I think to give himself a good shot here, he's got to stop the takedown, right? It's pretty simple. That's how he wins, and he's got to be sharp with his counter-striking. Um, so I think this is a little bit closer than you think, and because of that, 
I'm going to lean with the underdog Ooh, here, Marcin. All Piper. right. How about that? I love noise. it. All right, we close out the program with Place Your Bets, brought to you by JohnAnnick.com, where you can enjoy 20% off all Anik and Florian podcast and One More Sleep merchandise with promo code One More Sleep. All right, so Brian Petrie, as we update the standings from UFC 299, was minus $846.22 on the year. Good week for you, Bri. Three and one on your bets. You cashed for $300 exactly and 40 cents brings your annual year to date nut to minus 545.82. Nice. Now we get to uh, to my guy. You're my wingman. I need you. We got it all. The you girls love us. We're like wham. Kenny Florian was minus 1132.49 on the year. He sweeps the board 4 and 0 for $1,612.59. <laughs> that included a $400 straight wager on Dustin Poirier, straight wager for $300 on Michael Venom Page, straight wager on Curtis Blades, and then a three leg parlay for $150 that paid out at plus 280. On Macy Barber, minus 198. Curtis Blades, minus 115. And Sean O'Malley, minus 285. So Ken Flo goes from minus $1,132 to plus $480.10. Ken Flo now the leader in the clubhouse, Woo! up $1,000. You're up 1025.92, Ken Flo. So. Yeah, I, I just got to stay focused. I uh, just want to thank everybody who supported me. Yeah. Uh, I feel like uh, this is the best training camp of my life. Uh, uh, you know, just I, I respect Brian as an opponent. Uh, okay, sorry. All right, here we go. These are my bets. All right, th this is going to get this is going to be interesting because it's going to swing one way or another, Brian. We may be mm -hmm. uh, e even true. Steven next week, okay? Because I'm going to go with Mershart for 400. Nice. Straight wager on GM3. I like GM3 here okay. in this spot. I think it's a tough matchup for Bar Barbarina. Okay, uh, and I'm going to go with Ange, Ange, Losa. Ange Losa. Ange Losa for 300 Okay, $300 straight on Ange Losa at plus 120 Yes, sir. And then we have another straight bet, Tibora for 300 Marcin Ooh. Tibora at plus Right. Yeah, yeah. See, I feel like for me, Bri, if I was yeah. now plus, well, Kenny is plus four. Like, I feel like I would just be like, give me a thousand bucks straight on the guy I feel most confident I in. Know. Right. Like, like I'm, I was surprised nobody, uh, nobody was on Robellis to Spain straight last week. Right. Uh, but yeah. that's neither here nor there. Uh, cause Parisians are really good dude. Uh, all right, Bri, um, a little bit of work to do, but it's sure. not, not anything you can't fucking clean up on no. aisle nine. What do you have for us on <laughs> UFC fight night? Tui Vasa versus Tabor. So that was my game plan. I was going to go like 800 bucks or maybe a thousand on one guy, <clears throat> but Kenny and I are so opposite that now I think I can make some money back. Right. 300 on GM three. We read that same, that, that, uh, as well. Okay. 300 on C rod, Christian Oof. Rodriguez, which I know we're nice. opposite on 200 on Brian battle. And they give me 200 on tie to Avasa plus Oof. a shoey if he loses. Wow. So you guys really are split this week. Yeah, so uh, we like good dissension shit. and we like Brian Petrie. You can follow him on X at Brian Petrie MMA. Appreciate your brother. We will uh, we will talk to you next week as the hits keep on coming, sir. All hey, right. Hey. You guys are the best. I'll see you. And thanks to the man, Brian Petrie, for uh, that three name Jack, because that has become very useful uh, on television. Yes. All right, Ken Flo, before I let you go in about 60 seconds, I do need to get your thoughts on the announcement that Mike Tyson and Jake Paul will be competing on Netflix. As my colleague Chael Sonnen told me, we don't necessarily know if this is going to be boxing, weight class, how many rounds, what exactly is going to happen. Right. One thing we do know if his birth certificate is to be believed is that Mike Tyson will be 58 years of age when they wow. compete. Now, depending on which video you're ingesting, you have seen Mike Tyson in a wheelchair with a cane or absolutely destroying pads and looking like he could kill most any man on the street, you know, of any age. So I don't really know what my thesis statement is on the fight. I've been asking people if they think Mike Tyson can knock out Jake Paul. And, you know, if your answer to that is yes, then I would imagine you don't have any problem with this fight being made. Uh, but philosophically, a lot of people seem to have an issue with it because of Tyson's age. Um, what are your thoughts on this being distributed to the masses on Netflix? And uh, who do you think wins? Gosh, I, I mean, 
Jake Paul is an absolute promotional genius because he knows everyone wants to see him get knocked out. And he picked a guy in Mike Tyson who, yes, at 58 could probably still knock out, I think, most men on the planet. Um, you know, I look at some of those videos, John, that you were talking about him hitting pads. And I'm like, are they fast forwarding this thing? How is a 58 year old man still moving with that kind of speed and ferocity? Well, you're talking about Mike Tyson, who probably won the genetic lottery. So it's it's absolutely possible. Now, how able he is or how capable he's going to be later on in the fight, depending on how many rounds we're talking about, is another question. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how it goes. Uh, you know, I, I think it's an interesting one. It's one of those things where, you know, promotionally, you're like, this is genius. Fight wise with a 58 year old Mike Tyson I, I, I hope he doesn't get hurt. Now, is Jake Paul that guy to maybe hurt him? I don't know. Possibly. Jake yeah. isn't a small guy, right. uh, and his boxing skills shouldn't be slept on. So I'm curious. It's piqued my interest, and I don't typically like these kind of fights. So I don't know. I, out of all the fights that I get asked about, people have been hitting me up, blowing up my phone because of this one, which is interesting. Right. Well, full disclosure, I don't get the chance to sit down with Kenny in person in front of these podcast very often, but I was with Kenny on Friday night and we had watched the Francis Ngannou, Anthony Joshua stuff. And I think I said to you, like, are we going to talk about, like, we have to talk about this. And you're like, yeah. well, dude, like everybody's fucking texting me about Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul. So, uh, I guess we're talking about it a little bit. All right. Kenny Floyd, martial arts.com is live as is John where you can support the show with our merchandise and Florian podcast stuff. One more sleep all yours at John with promo code. One more sleep. Also don't forget Bilal Muhammad and Jason Anik live with remember the show every Thursday on the Anik and Florian podcast, YouTube channel. All right, we got to get on out of here. Thanks to Ray Longo, UFC bandweight contender, Kyler Phillips, Brian Petrie, our executive producer, Cody Merrow, and all of you out there, most importantly for all the support in person and otherwise, and for supporting the Anik and Florian podcast. We will be back with you next Monday to recap Tui Vasa and Tabora. Until then, for Kempflom, I'm John Anik. Have a great week. Go fucking late. He's an open man. He's cornbread. Cornbread. Uh, he's cornbread.